morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this year's annual health conference organized by the Mental Health Organization in Gozo, in collaboration with Queen Mary University of London Malta campus. <clears throat> thank, thank you all for thank you all for coming here. Well, actually, for getting out of bed. Um, I know you were all expecting Mark Lawrence as your host today. Imma sfortunatamente telefishara bank. Uh, for the non-Maltese speakers, um, only Maltese people will get this joke. It's a long story, and for more information, Google Sharabank. The conference is different from the previous years, not only team-wise, of course, but also because of the current situation we are in. These were our trying times. Not only is the state of this pandemic itself stressful enough for each and every human being, we were in a way forced to cut off essential elements which defined us as human beings. Physicality, human interactions, human touch, basic things which prior to this crazy yet historic moment in time, we took for granted. I, for one, as cheesy as it, as it may sound, took simple things like breathing and simply having food on the table for granted before this whole pandemic. For others, it was a moment to finally breathe and become one with their family. For others, this whole pandemic took a serious toll upon their mental health. I, for one, fall within this category. And today, I am not only here as a host, but I am also here as an eager learner. I am eager to learn. And throughout this whole darkness, maybe find a way to once again reach the light. So, the first person I would like to welcome today is none other than Her Excellency, former President of Malta, Mary Louise Colero Preca. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Uh, Hi. And uh, I'd like to well um, uh, say hello to Pauline Camilleri, the chair of the Mental Health Association Gozo, and all the members, and particularly on this very special occasion of the 10th anniversary of the association. And I'd like to personally thank them and on behalf of the, all the people that they have come across for the change that they have managed to bring to Godzitans and to society as a whole with their endeavors um, in their mental um, health, uh, well, work that they have been doing all through these 10 years. Also, I'd like to say hello to the members of the Academia from Queen Mary University of London, the Malta campus. Dr. Anton Gregg, who I am sure he is following this, has always been so present, the head of the psychiatry department in our state hospitals, and each and every um, participant, and well, all our friends today. So um, I, I would like to start my contribution to this important conference by repeating a statement which we are um, hearing relentlessly everywhere. Everybody is saying we are living in, unpre in an unprecedented times. Yet, very true, COVID-19 has completely changed our lives. Our lives have been completely disrupted and in the process of this complete change, the pandemic is forcing us to adapt and change to new circumstances that are prevailing. Humankind, however, is not new to such a scenario. So I would like to give some courage out there. The world has gone through pandemics before and subsequently. The world had to adapt to the new circumstances which developed as an effect. And let me take a factual example from history. The Black Death, or as we call it, the, the plague. It, it is said that it has wiped out half of Europe's population in the 14th century. This pandemic completely changed the course of history 
in Europe. The plague killed so many people that as a consequence of not having enough people to work, it even brought better pay for workers and brought an end to serve them in Europe. Having said that, today, everyone is feeling that COVID-19 has affected every facet of our lives. COVID-19 has made us more aware of the already existing social inequalities that make certain groups in our society more vulnerable to the impact and effects of the pandemic. As research by international organizations, such as OECD and UNICEF is showing, Everyone is being affected. However, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, children and the elderly are the more affected. This unprecedented situation brought about by the pandemic has required quick action with very little, if any, time to think and plan. It has also meant that a lot of our previous coping strategies are no longer effective. This means that we are now faced with a lot to cope with, that we need to adapt quickly and build the necessary resilience to manage the new situations that are cropping up every day in all aspects of our lives. Yes, this situation has affected most of us. Many of us are even being faced with mental health challenges. We have come to realize how susceptible, in fact, we are to mental health. COVID-19 has really hit home. This situation is evidenced by recent studies, which I would like to refer to in the course of my contribution. And I would like to start with a look at research by economist and university lecturer, Dr. Mari Brigulio, together with two other economists, Mark Carwan and Nathaniel De Bono, which was carried out as an online survey to identify people's experiences during the lockdown and the considerable impact on their lifestyles. This research aimed to identify the potential effects on mental health and well-being and was tied to the economy with the social well-being of respondents. It focused on what determined people's happiness during self-quarantine as governments across the world struggled to control the pandemic while trying to limit its economic fallout. The results show that the level of happiness among the 1,800 participants in this study dropped by a third by the third week of COVID-19 outbreak in Malta. Richmond Foundation has also carried out a survey to monitor the psychological well-being of people living in Malta under the unprecedented restrictions of social interaction. The results of this survey show that feelings of depression ranged from 27.4% of respondents aged between 25 and 34 years of age to 13.5 in those aged 55 to 64 of age at the beginning of the pandemic. There was also a marked difference in gender with 25.9% of women reporting that they felt depressed on five to seven days per week, while the percentage of men was 12.6%. In another case study about the mental health impact of COVID-19, Polan and Ruben Grek assert that the constant fear of contracting the virus in a pandemic such as COVID-19 is further compounded by the significant changes to our daily lives as our movements are restricted in support of efforts to contain and slow down the spread of the virus. Greg and Greg pointed out that the new realities of working from home, temporary unemployment, homeschooling of children, and lack of physical contact with other family members, friends, and colleagues brought mental health issues to the fore. And they state, and I quote, on 7 March, the first case of COVID was detected in Malta. Understandably, this escalated the national anxiety. As the number of cases rose to nine, schools were closed, and this was when the impact on mental health started to be felt. Greg and Greg further state, and again I quote, while the COVID-19 situation in Malta is still unfolding, it is evident that the current impact on mental well-being is much higher than that on, nation, on the nation's physical health. 
an infrastructure that is strengthened by adequate preparedness and their other and clear communication to the people has until now been the main effective factor that limited mental health challenges. This means that basically the fact that we had clear and continuous communication from the authorities about the pandemic has helped to limit the effects on our mental health. It also means that even the connection through social media, which has provided social interaction where people spoke and shared their thoughts and experiences has also helped to limit the effects on mental health. Now let us look at the picture in terms of the global context. The BBC describes the current situation as a world story like no other. The World Health Organization states that the coronavirus pandemic affected the education and learning of 67.6% of students across 143 um, countries. It further highlights the fact that the transition from attending physical classes has significantly disrupted the life of students and their families, posing a potential risk to the mental well-being and children. Such a significant change in the learning environment together with limited social interactions with other students posed an unusual situation for children development, who therefore encouraged the scientific community and healthcare workers to assess and analyze the psychological impact caused by the coronavirus pandemic on children and adolescents as several mental health disorders begin during childhood. A study carried out by Young Minds UK, which started in March and then continued in summer, investigated the mental health impact of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic on young people. Results clearly indicate that many people are under increasing pressure and struggling to get the right support. The study found that 80% of respondents agreed that the coronavirus pandemic had made their mental health worse. 41% said it had made their mental health much worse. This indicator is up from 32% in the previous survey conducted in March. This was related to increased feelings of anxiety, isolation, a loss of coping mechanisms, or a loss of motivation. Fear, worry, and stress are normal responses to perceived or real threats. And when we are faced with uncertainty or the unknown, it is therefore normal and understandable that people are experiencing fear in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Health Organization issued guidelines on a daily basis to help elevate fear and enhance mental health skills for both frontliners and the population in general. While the saying, there is no place like home may be true to many of us, the pandemic has taken this to a new level. Our sanctuary, may have been, become our place of confinement. And I believe this has a bearing on our mental and emotional well-being. Online meetings have invaded our privacy with work colleagues and associates coming into our homes. However, there are much worse scenarios. For example, people have no roof over their heads. People, the vast majority being women who are victims of domestic violence or children who are victims of abuse, all of which have been exuberated by the restrictions. According to Antonio Guterres, United Nations Secretary General, domestic violence and sexual abuse, which he called as a pandemic within a pandemic, has brought about a threefold increase in domestic violence. Guterres appealed for, a, as he called it, a ceasefire in homes in what he called a horrifying global surge in violence against women and girls. As Maslow, the famous psychologist, rightly reminds us, the first and most basic of all needs are the need for food and shelter. A hungry person would not be interested in anything except to satisfy hunger. The pandemic brought this reality to many families who had never imagined this was possible. A social worker who referred clients 
to the food aid project by the Malta Trust Foundation stated that, and I quote, the delivery of the food became the highlight of the day for many. We are all aware that the pandemic is causing anxiety, uncertainty, and disruption. And this is often the case, and, this, and as is evidenced by research, people living in hunger and poverty are likely to suffer the most. Oxfam declared that the COVID-19 pandemic is deepening the hunger crisis in the world and creating new epicenters of hunger across the globe. Oxfam also states that by the end of this year, 12,000 people every day could die from hunger linked to COVID-19, potentially more than those who will die from the disease itself. Food insecurity, the fact that a person does not know where and if they will get their next meal has also been shown to be a marker of poor mental health with studies identifying associations with mood and anxiety disorders and suicidal ideation, particularly among women. Through the telephone calls, first, my first hand experience, I have received that I have received for food aid during lockdown. I repeatedly heard the desperate cry of, what am I going to feed my children? And this was particularly from mothers. Volunteers of the Food Aid Project of the Malta Trust Foundation who delivered food packages to the doorstep during the lockdown, often recounted experiences of children running to the door and rummaging into boxes and bags of food and asking their parents to cook them something to eat. I cannot end this contribution without sharing with you some thoughts about the effects of COVID-19 on children, as unfortunately, more often than not, children are forgotten in the bigger, the bigger picture. Yet we all appreciate that the pandemic disrupted and completely altered the lives of children and young people across the world. Children had to adjust to, a dra to dramatic changes in their education, their family and social life, and their home life, with some experiencing bereavement in horrifying circumstances. This is, even, this is even more real in the case of marginalized and disadvantaged children who bear a harsher brunt in difficult times. According to Gosh et al., although medical literature shows that children are minimally susceptible to the 19, 2019 corona disease, they are hit the hardest by the psychosocial impact of this pandemic, being quarantined in homes and institutions may impose greater psychological burden than the physical sufferings caused by the virus. As early as March 2020, the Madrid pediatrician Alicia Arevalo had already stated, and I quote her, we're seeing more children with nervousness, more with insomnia, more with chest and pains and stomach pains. I'm pleased to say that the Children's Hub, led by the Malta Foundation for the Wellbeing of Society, continued to meet virtually during the lockdown. The opportunity created a safer space for children to air their views, share their feelings, and reflect on their lives during such a difficult time. I must say that the children shared their experiences so vividly that I will undoubtedly remember many of their remarks all my life. I will therefore share a few examples of their, state, of their statements with you today. Statements that reflect their mental well-being during the lockdown earlier this year. I hope these statements will help you to further stimulate your thoughts during today. These are some examples of the statements which have been extracted from the meetings of the Council and Young Persons Council within the Malta Foundation for the Wellbeing of Society, and which were carried out between March and June of this year. I have decided to share these statements without editing them in any way. Therefore, I will refer to the first statement. One child said, we are stocking loads and loads of noodles. We will eat noodles, loads of noodles as my dad's business is closed. Another child remarked, 
I am feeling extra. Adults around me are all the time telling me to go to my room and be quiet. Thank you for these meetings. At least here, I know you care. A young person said, this is in Maltese, but I will translate for, our, for the benefit of our English speaking friends. He ended in a situation in Hosnim Day Yahafna. Ashnim Misyal Habib, Ulalima Kolatiye. This translates into this situation is making me unhappy as I miss my friends and teachers. Another young person stated, I am settling to the new routine with lessons. However, it is more challenging to stay focused and there is a lot more pressure on us students. It is all very stressful. A child told us, it's not quite easy because as a person that has two other sisters and only has two laptops to work with, although one of them is very slow, but we try to make the most, most out of it, we are constantly having lessons conflicting with each other. Another young person remarked, Uffa, no, at the dark, the feature, kul yumin hosni aktarim deya, lima narashlil, bibtiye veru tuwe jani, et ni prova man jilich mahiya, laktar haja sabiha ya li teacher tiye, vera ti prova tamil afarit sbiq, ufan. And this translates into, Uffa, it's difficult to stay at home. Every day I feel more unhappy. Not seeing my friends is very painful. I'm trying not to argue with my brother. The best thing is that my teacher is really trying to make things interesting and fun for us. A child emphasized that Lanqas tista tanna lil bib tiegħek hux. Il-computer isu jweġġa lek għajnejk. Kważi tħossok qed tama. And it translates from home you can't get the sun which I like so much and which I know it is good for my health. From home I cannot go out on breaks with others. I know that being with other children is important, and although we meet in the council and during other activities, it is not the same. You cannot even hug your friends. The computer seems to be hurting your eyes. You almost feel like that you're going blind. The children brought to the fore a number of real issues which were touching their lives during this time and which all impinge on their mental health and well-being. The pandemic is affecting every sphere of their lives, whether it is poverty, unemployment, not having enough, money for food, domestic abuse or violence, their social interactions, and much more. Many of, us, many of us feel that COVID-19 pandemic is affecting our mental health and well-being. Research both, both local and global has confirmed this repeatedly. And in this context, some questions immediately come to mind. What are we going to do about it? How will we restore the mental health, the mental well-being of all humankind? Are we adequately equipped to deal with this magnitude? Are our authorities affording enough resources to deal with these societal mental health challenges? Are we proactive enough and putting in place the necessary preventive strategies and action plans? Are we investing enough in our children's mental health and well-being now. Most of us will, will overcome the pandemic and, back, and get back to our physical health. Others, unfortunately, will succumb to it, leaving behind loved ones wondering, why is this happening to them? Yet many more will have scars from the mental trauma we are living through, scars that might, that might be undetected right now or ignored or simply swept under the carpet. Together we must ensure that every person who is affected will find the necessary refuge and support. We cannot be complacent and stare at these issues, which if unaddressed will dilute 
all possibilities of resilience in our communities and societies for years to come. We need to unite and collaborate. Collaboration is key. I am convinced that together we can overcome. I will therefore leave you with an inspiring quote from Mother Teresa of Calcutta regarding the effect of working together with love for the well-being of others. And I quote, none of us, including me, ever do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. And together we can do something wonderful. Finally, while I augur you a most constructive um, conference, I would like to urge all of us to do the small things with great love together to overcome the challenges of mental health for each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for taking time out of your morning to join us and for your very enlightening and inspirational presentation. Thank you. Have a nice day. Now, I would like to introduce senior lecturer and chairman of the government's mental health services, uh, Dr. Anton Grek. Thank you, Clara, for your introduction. Can I have the first slide, please? Um, I'm going to talk about the effect of social media during the pandemic times in Malta. When we talk about social media, we're talking about um, computer-based technology that facilitates the sharing of ideas, thoughts, and information through the building of virtual networks and communities. This is the definition of social media. Putting it in context, in Malta, um, in Malta, Facebook is extremely popular. In fact, it's one of the countries where it's very popular. Then Instagram is popular as well, and then Twitter. Twitter is not that it is popular, but um, in certain countries, Twitter is much more popular um, um, than, than, than Facebook. In Malta, Facebook is the, most, um, um, is the most popular. Now, to show how important social media is in Malta, the Eurobarometer of 2019 has shown that 79% of the population of Malta use social network every day. Just to make a comparison, Cypriots nearly use the same amount, 83% and Germans use 52%. Um, in fact, in Malta, only 5% do, do not use social media, which is, um, as you know, very low. Now, um, this is very baffling, and for me, for a psychiatrist, it, it makes me thinking. So, we live in a small country, and we're the more, nearly one of the most densely populated um, countries in the world. So we live in very close proximity. And we have very strong extended families. Um, uh, we meet each other, the families, very regularly. And we have a very Mediterranean culture of festas and celebrations. Unfortunately, during these times, we cannot. But that's our style. So. Even though we have all these face-to-face -face interactions and social interactions, social media is extremely popular, and this really intrigues me. There is no research to show why social media is so, so that important. I have my personal impressions, and I think that social media is not replacing what we socially like to do, um, but it's an extension of it. We have an innate need to talk and connect, and being Mediterranean, to gossip, 
and social media is used for these things. Also, we like to keep abreast of official news, etc. And social media um, is taking that role. In fact, um, many Maltese are following news through social media. So, this is the background of social media in Malta. Now, let's go back to the beginning of um, the COVID times. What was happening in Malta? Um, our neighbors, the Italian neighbors, at that time were really suffering, and everyone was shocked with the Bergamo images. If, if you talk to people, everyone will tell you the the impression the, the, that left these trucks um, carrying um, dead people and people dying very close to home, especially in Bergamo. Life as we know it stopped it completely. And we all went into a lockdown. And this changed the whole um, social scenario completely. From being an island full of festas, parties, Sunday lunches, suddenly we all became locked into our home. And now as, a, as an academic, I, I, I started to, to think this is something which is good to analyze. Um, how did this change of social scenario and the effect of social media interrelate to each other? And this is very important, even from the psychiatric, psychological point of view, because there is research which shows that in times of crisis, people rely heavily on social media and seek to remain connected and eliminate loneliness by staying connected with family and friends while keeping abreast with the latest news. So what was happening in Malta? We um, carried out a study, and now I'll explain um, how the study was. And what we wanted to know is, with this change of social scenario and the background of our behavior online in Malta, um, what was happening? Did people engage more? Did people engage less? And what's even more important, did the quality of the engagement on social media change? So we studied a data set on Facebook um, covering four months from February to May, which is the first wave of the pandemic. And in the study, we studied more than 50,000 comments and more than 150,000 interactions. So it was quite a, a big number. I'm not going to go into the, uh, the detail of how these were studied, but basically we studied a model which um, took into account both the quantitative element, the amount of interactions, but also the qualitative element, the quality, the type um, of the interactions. And the qualitative element was um, taken from the type of response. As you know, in Facebook, you can make like, love, hug, angry. So we saw um, the types of these responses and also um, analyzing the comments that people were making. So between February and May, online interaction um, in, in the social media increased by 200%, which is very significant. What is also very significant is that this interaction was statistically significant um, to the amount of COVID positive patients. So to show it graphically, here we have, um, we have these um, graph to show that the more, so we had online interaction increased, and as I said, overall increased by 200%. 
But the more the positive cases there were, um, the more was the interaction. What was happening in Malta that there were daily briefings of how many positive cases there were um, of positive COVID cases. And the more that there were COVID, COVID positive cases, the more there was online interaction. And this was statistically significant. More interestingly, um, it was the type of emotions that the, the type of response there was. And during this time, between February and April, the posts portraying a sense of care, affection, and unity, so positive emotions, increased by 300%. And again, this, um, this, this increase in positive emotional reactions was correlated to the number of positive cases, as this graph shows. So the more there were patients positive reported in Malta, the type of interactions within Facebook not only increased, but they became more positively emotional. Now, how can we interpret these results? First of all, one can say that the quantitative element, the, the fact that there were more online interactions was because people were at home, they traveled less, and they had more time, and they so spent it on social media. There could be some element of that, of course, but the 100 increase for, um, increase for this very high. And one can also say that smartphones are used a lot. So the fact that people were at home didn't mean that they had more access to social media because um, with smartphones, they have access everywhere, not at home only. Also, the fact that there was less traveling and so more time available, people could have used it for other things, not only for social media interaction. So it's not only a question of um, there was more access to social media and more time available. What I think was happening was that social media was used to compensate for social isolation and for the management of mood. There is, um, there, there is already research that shows that social support networks online can increase resilience to stress. And we all agree that these pandemic waves um, are highly stressful periods. And in a way, the face-to-face the so, the -face interactions and the social interactions that we have lost now could be replaced with the friends in Facebook. I say friends because it's um, with an inverted commas, because these are different dynamics which need to be studied further. Um, the friends on Facebook could be different from the friends that you meet regularly. You can have the friends that usually meet in bars, during traveling, etc. And they would be also friends on Facebook. But one can also have friends, persons that he, um, he or she has never met. So it would be interesting to study further. If during these stressful periods, these interactions are mainly with friends that you know socially, or it with the extended number of friends that you don't know meet socially. Regarding using social media to manage mood, it's extremely interesting how um, during this time, the, the type of mood that was mostly present in, 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 in social media was of care, affection, unity. Um, one would have thought that it could be of anger, um, anxiety, etc. So I think that when one is in times of fear and anxiety, there is one way of dealing with it is to connect more with others. And this connection um, 
decreases a little the negative impact of the anxiety. So you're very anxious, you connect to others, and this decreases the anxiety. And it seems that, as the study shows, that social media Malta was used during these highly stressful times to decrease this anxiety. So, in a nutshell, what we have found in this study is that uh, social media had a very important role. It already had a very important role in life in Malta. Um, as I said, only 5% don't use social media. But during these highly stressful times, um, social media um, was used much more. And the type of affect that was used during this time was of care, unity, support. And both the use and the positive effect was positively correlated to the amount of patients that were diagnosed with um, positive for COVID-19. So the more that there were patients, the more that there were social media interactions, and the more um, there were um, interactions with feelings of good effect. I wish to thank my co-researchers, Mr. Steve Vajus and Professor Victor Gregg for this, um, for doing this research together. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Grek. Um, now we have a few questions um, our viewers have sent in. So Peter wants to ask, what is the relationship between social media and anxiety during these times? But um, as the research has shown that social media could be used to reduce anxiety. But now I'm going to talk, answer as a psychiatrist, not as a researcher. One need to be careful not to increase the anxiety with social media, because um, what happens is that in the social media, there is a lot of information. And um, some people during these times have used social media to get the information. And one needs to be careful from information overload and false information. So many people have had um, a lot of beliefs which they found in social media about how to deal with COVID, etc., which were false, and they made harm. Also, many people became obsessed all the time looking for information of how many there were cases in Malta, how many died in different countries, etc. In fact, one of the advice that I used to give to my clients and to everyone is to delimit the amount of looking for information in the social media. Um, because, and I used to tell them, don't spend more than one hour per day. Because the more you look for information, the more you became anxious. So social media can be used positively to connect with people and to decrease anxiety by connecting with people. But if it's used to get a lot of information, which is vast and false, then it is used negatively. So we need to be careful how to use it. Even, for example, I can imagine looking up symptoms. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, um, if it's very important that one gets the advice from, from the experts. Mm -hmm. Many people might have symptoms or something, they start doing a search um, on the internet and obviously the search would be very vague and it, it, it mentions everything and things out of context and especially persons who have tendency to worry a lot about their health, it's not advisable to use it to get information. Mm -hmm. Information needs to get by asking a, an expert who knows the context and can give you a proper answer. Rather than looking up. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, our next question is from Denise. And it, is, it isn't about social media, really. So what she asked was for concise ideas on how to improve mental health at the workplace. Uh, mental health at the workplace is extremely important. In fact, it, research worldwide shows that um, one of the main causes of loss of productivity and loss of work is due to mental health problems. So employers need to be very careful to ma make sure that there is good mental health policy within, um, within the place of work. We have managed to make a lot of improvement in terms of physical health, safety. Now we are at this stage where it's very important to give emphasis on, on mental health. I think each workplace should have a, a champion, a person which is in charge of the mental health, so that good policies can be, and can be done. Also, it's very important that the workers are helped how to deal with stress, because one of the main causes of problems in mental health is stress. And in the workplace, generally, there is a lot of stress. So um, workers need to be helped how to deal with stress and increase resilience. The employer needs to produce an environment which takes care of people. I think that's the best combination. Thank you very much for taking your time to come here. Um, now the and next... Thank you, Clara, for introducing <laughs> me. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> Um, so, the next person I would like to introduce is Dr. Chantelle Atzopardi. She is a resident specialist in psychiatry at the Mental Health Service in Gozo. Hi, Dr. Hi. Chantelle. Good morning, thank you for, thank you for the invitation. Um, I will, today I will be talking about what I call the second pandemic, COVID-19, the second mental health pandemic. Um, and I, I'm going to go a bit through the effect of COVID-19 on mental health mm -hmm. and then give some tips in general to how to combat these issues. Okay. You may start your presentation yes. if you like. Do I have the presentation, please? Okay, so why is COVID-19 affecting us this much? How is it that um, it, is, it is affecting us in general? It's a new virus. Um, as humans, we usually tend to have fear of the unknown. And it's a threat to humans. It is basically, as uh, Her Excellency said in her presentation, undermining our basic need of safety. This is a typical representation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where we can find that our basic needs of um, uh, satisfying hunger, sleep, and safety are down at the bottom. So we, we're down to um, literally being afraid for our own safety. And that is something that will, has affected us as, as, a human, as human beings. And as we know, and it's already been discussed, there have been a lot of different consequences of COVID-19. The most obvious being the physical consequences. There's the social consequ consequences, which have already been discussed. So the effect on um, social relationships, the effect on uh, employment, on the way we work, the effect on how we celebrate on our culture, leading as well to financial consequences. And there's also a lot of ethical consequences. I mean, um, when you look at it, do we, do we tackle COVID-19 from the child's perspective, whose risk is relatively low, to the, extent, to the uh, detriment then of the elderly population? Or do we look at it from the elderly perspective? and go on with herd immunity 
or go on with lockdowns and then that can affect in turn um, children and their mental health, mental health being and their education. And what we're going to focus today on is the mental consequences of COVID-19 and its effect on, on mental health. But we cannot look at mental health without um, considering everything in, in uh, all the other consequences. And the most common feeling that we have been having with COVID-19 is anxiety. Anxiety is defined as a feeling of uneasiness and worry. It has a lot of um, different symptoms, but all of us have felt anxious at some point or another throughout our lives. And to some extent, it is normal to feel anxious about COVID-19 because of what I have already explained, because of the fact that it's new, because of the fact that it's a threat, and we still don't know exactly what's going to happen. So there are advantages to us feeling anxious. Um, the body uses anxiety in situations of fight or flight. And what happens when we're anxious, the body changes, the hormone changes, keep us alert and alert us to stay safe in, in dangerous or potential dangerous situations. So in this case, feeling a bit anxious about COVID-19 will help us to uh, keep, for example, to the public health measures, to wash our hands, to remind us to wear our masks. So a bit of anxiety is actually um, an advantage for us. However, if it is anxiety becomes overwhelming, then it decreases our ability to function. And that is where anxiety disorders come in. And these have physical, bodily changes, mental changes, the thoughts that come in, perhaps obsessions, um, more uh, risk of having obsessions and compulsions, and psychological symptoms, uh, as well as uh, cognitive symptoms, we call them. So problems with concentrating, this is a typical graph we usually use when we consider the effects of anxiety. So a bit of anxiety at the beginning as it rises up, it actually increases our performance because it puts us on the alert. It's the same as it happens before we have an exam, for example. But too much anxiety will actually decrease that performance and our ability to, to function. And that is where it becomes a problem. So who is most at risk from COVID-19 anxiety and stress? It is more or less COVID-19 anxiety is affecting everyone, but there are certain populations of people who are more at risk um, of uh, having consequences and developing mental health problems secondary to this stress. The vulnerable population, when I say vulnerable, I mean um, the definition of vulnerable that the public, public health uh, um, uh, explained. So people over the age of 65, people with chronic medical illnesses and pregnant women. These are described as the vulnerable population who are most at risk of complications of COVID-19. Children and young adults, although not at risk due to, not, not, not very highly at risk, you will, you will hear that about that later, um, for physical complications. They are at a high, at a, at a difficult, at a sensitive age of development, and so they are at risk of um, having social, mental health problems, which might affect them in the in the future. Essential workers, especially frontliners, so we're talking about um, healthcare workers, teachers, um, we're talking about police officers. These these workers are especially at risk from COVID-19 stress, because they are expected to be the heroes of the situation. But believe me, no one, <laughs> no frontliner um, is, is happy about being a frontliner during the pandemic. But yes, they do, they go on and work. And they are especially vulnerable, especially healthcare workers, who find it very difficult to, to look for help many times. Caregivers for dependent adults. And this has been a huge problem, even in my practice. So we, we, we have people with intellectual or physical disabilities and people with dementia, for example, who are being cared for by 
by um, adult caregivers, by their children, by their, by their parents. And it has put a toll on them, on the carers themselves, because um, the fear of, of their vulnerable um, dependent, dependent adults getting the disease and also the fact that many uh, places have ha had closed for a time. Um, respite centers, for example, um, day, day, day clinics and day centers. So it, it, it puts a huge burden back on caregivers. The unemployed and unemployment rates have risen, understandably, and not just the unemployed, but also those who, whose work hours have decreased and less, having, resulting in less income. As I said, people with disabilities and developmental delay, here we are describing people on the autistic spectrum, where for people with these mental health problems, um, they find it more difficult to adapt to change. Socially isolated people, so those who live alone, maybe elderly people who, who now had to stay alone to, to isolate from, from others to decrease their risk. Homeless people, and importantly, those who have had past mental illness in the past and substance use disorders. So these are all people who are more likely to be affected by stress, by the stress of COVID. And COVID has had both direct effects on mental health and indirect. So as we can see, um, in general, not just during the pandemic, mental illness can be precipitated by any stress. So we can say that COVID is one of the stress that can precipitate these illnesses. In fact, there is current evidence of an increase in anxiety disorders in general. So we're talking about generalized anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, health anxiety disorders, and also post-traumatic stress disorder and what we call vicarious trauma. For example, in frontliners who work with patients um, dying of COVID-19. Um, this is something that we, we know that happens in healthcare workers who, who uh, support the, these people. But um, uh, the risk of anxiety disorders and act the actual rate has increased. Um, also, the rate of depression has, has been shown to increase, as well as suicidal ideation. And this has been confirmed both by um, studies done abroad, US studies, and through local surveys, such as the survey um, carried out by Richmond Foundation. So this is all on the increase. Also, although I haven't found much evidence, stress is known to be a, precipita a precipitating factor for other mental illnesses, such as, for example, psychosis. So those were mostly the direct effects of COVID on mental health. But there are also the indirect effects. I will go quickly through them because they have been mentioned already. So social isolation, secondary to social distancing measures, the employment and financial struggles, Carer burnout from closure of the schools and the nurseries. Um, the increase in domestic violence, which leads to increased risk um, of mental health problems. And the, we need to talk as well about the long term effects of, for example, children having a lack of school structure for quite a, a long time. Because we have to consider that maybe a few months or a year is a short time uh, relative to uh, a person's uh, life, but for a child, a few months and, and years is a long time. And we also have to think of what happened due to disruption of the mental health services. As we know, because of uh, when, when uh, COVID-19 hit, the first wave hit, uh, as public health measures came into place, there was closure of community and outpatients clinic in the mental health service. And this caused disruption. It, the disruption was not just seen in Malta and Gozo, it was seen worldwide. It, it brought us to revert a lot to telemedicine. However, there's advantages and disadvantages of this. It was, we were in a, so, in a sort of way lucky um, to have telemedicine to use, to reach out to our patients and to continue with our management. However, there are disadvantages to that as well. 
So some people prefer face-to-face -face interaction, um, even depending on the patient's condition, on the person's condition. Um, it's not the same as having someone, a client face-to-face -face when, you're, when you're doing telemedicine. And there might be, have been patients or clients who would not have access to, to internet or social media. The evidence shows of, during COVID that there is increased, in, there has been an increase in mental illness and suicidal ideation, but funnily enough, there was a decrease in hospital presentation, even for mental health problems. So this was seen not just for psychiatry or, or mental health, but also in other medical specialties. And why? Why are people using the services less, considering that they need it more? As we said, service disruption from our part could have caused them to, to come less. There is a fear of contracting COVID-19 from hospitals and clinics, which is an unfounded fear. Yes, there is risk wherever you go or whenever you go out, but here we, in all hospitals and clinics, we take the, the measures necessary. So it is, it is important for people to still look for help and attend their appointments. Also increased in social isolation might have led, for example, to, for loved ones to miss out on mental health problems in, in relatives because many times it's those around us who realize that we need help. Also, the effects of mental, of mental health may not be immediate. They are more likely to come later than the effects of COVID itself and last longer. And quickly, I would like to, to, to mention stigma. What is stigma? Stigma is something that we've been seeing more and more with the, related to COVID-19. So a stigma by definition is a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, a quality or a person. And why? Why do we stigmatize people? Why do, do us humans end up stigmatizing others? Again, it's the fear of the unknown and an innate need for us to kind of blame someone or something. So it is very easy to point our fingers. And it leads to discrimination of people being stigmatized and as well of people, it leads to people who might have COVID-19 symptoms, for example, but fear seeking help because of the stigma attached to it. And that in turn causes um, more risk of uh, COVID-19 spreading if people don't seek the necessary help. And who are these people who are subject to stigma? So people who, who have been positive or who are positive um, sometimes are being stigmatized because where did, where did that person go? Um, you know, local gossip. Why did they go to that party? Why did they leave? Where did they get it from? Why didn't they, they, why didn't they be more careful? So these are all things that leads to stigma. Healthcare workers and essential workers at times are also victims of stigma because of the fact that we work in close contact with people who might be COVID-19 positive. Those who live in a group settings, in, in group homes, for example, um, because they, they uh, cannot live, they cannot socially isolate. And ethnicity has played a part as well, especially in the beginning where everyone was blaming, blaming for example, um, people of Chinese descent of bringing this upon us. But this is all due to stigma, it is all due to the fear of the unknown and need to blame someone. And stigmatizing people will be counterproductive to our ability to control COVID-19. And I would like to um, end the last part of my presentation by discussing a bit how to cope with all this stress on a positive note. So I'm basing my um, suggestions on the World Health Organization and, and uh, what they say as well. So first of all, it's important to talk about what, we are, what you are feeling. It is normal to have a range of feelings during this crisis. So worry, fear, anger. Um, but, and it's important for you, for us, to develop um, a network of people who we trust, be it friends, family, trusted colleagues. This will help us get through the pandemic, get through the stress. On our problems. It's not working. Just that little slightly miss, I'm sure, John.
We need to be healthy, diet, exercise, keeping a routine, um, relaxing, making time to unwind, and if you are a spiritual person, even seeking solace in your spiritual rituals. Next slide, please. Care for your physical health. So yes, do follow the public health guidelines for, for uh, social distancing. And it's, it's good for you to have a backup plan so you know what to do if you feel sick or you think you have COVID. Keep uh, uh, the number of a healthcare provider and the, the COVID helpline, we all know it to be 111. Okay. Care for your mental health. So seek help. If you are having mental health problems, reach out to your counsellor, to your psychologist, to your family doctor. If you already have been followed up by a psychiatrist or a team, speak to your key worker. And Richmond have also provided a helpline, a 24-hour-7 helpline. Um, the number is 1770, so you can call and ask for direction if you have mental health problems. Um, this is something important as well, to get your facts right and use credible sources. Um, people go, I say, I usually call it, they go to Dr. Google, as if Google is the expert and um, you find all the answers there. But it's important to keep to reliable resources. So the WHO, ECDC, public health sources. And remember that the evidence is still growing and the pandemic phase is progressed. So when, for example, WHO in March, they, they were in for lockdowns and now they aren't, it's not because they don't know what they're doing. It's the other way around, it's because they do know what they're doing, the evidence grows and they give the best possible advice for the moment that we are in at the moment, because things change. As Dr. Greg said before me, control your exposure to the information, limit frequent checks on social media and amplify positive news. So do look out for um, news that are positive. So let's not just look at the death rate, but also at the recovery rate, for example. And individually, we need to foster resilience. What is resilience? Resilience is the capacity of a system to, to get back in shape after losing that shape, kind of. So you're under stress, but then you get back into, into shape, like an elastic band. And studies have shown that during COVID, people with high individual resilience were less likely to suffer from anxiety. But the good news is that we can learn to be resilient. It's not something that you either have or you don't. And whatever your age and your situation, you can become more resilient. And here are some quick tips. So you connect with others, find a sense of purpose for yourself, be it um, a hobby, be it voluntary work, be it focusing more on your job, on your career. So finding a sense of purpose will, will help you um, become more resilient and nurture yourself both physically, mentally and spiritually. You have to believe in your abilities and whenever we have setbacks or make mistakes we have to see them as gaining experience and not as a defeat. We need to learn to be flexible and embrace change and even the, the most rigid of us can do it, it's not impossible. Be optimistic do not ask yourself why, why is this happening to me, why is this happening now, but ask yourself how have I gone through past difficulties, how did I manage in the past and how will I manage in the future. And make attainable goals and act on them. So if you have a lot to do, you're feeling overwhelmed, make sure that your goals are, are attainable, are broken down in different steps and then you do act on them, but also keep working on yourself. Keep working on yourself um, to continue to improve. So to conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic will inevitably lead to, to a second pandemic, what I call a second pandemic of mental health, whose repercussions will probably be more long lasting. So we, we're not seeing everything now, but there is hope, do not lose hope. And getting through the mental health pandemic requires us on individual level to build resilience, as a community to respect each other. I know there's different opinions, but basic, essentially just by um, uh, adhering to public health measures, social distancing, using a mask, helping the neighbors and our neighbors, those who are in need, it will make this both mentally and, and physically, um, it, will, it will make this pandemic go through faster and in a more effective manner. And at the government level, 
yes, the government needs to invest more in mental health to provide to pr prevent this mental health pandemic that we are expecting and we are living in. And the, on the 10th October, we celebrate World Mental Health Day, and that was the topic of this year's World Mental Health Day. For um, at, at a national level, at uh, government level, for, for governments to invest more in mental health to prevent all the repercussions. So yes, there is hope. Thank you and stay safe. And I've put here the rainbow done by my children earlier this year. To remember that there is always a rainbow after the rain. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Atsapardi, uh, for that presentation. Um, just as we asked Dr. Grek, we have a few questions for you. Of course. So we have a particular question. Um, someone asked for you to specify a bit more about self-harm and suicidal ideation during these times. Well, self-harm and suicidal ideation um, is something that many people go through and experience. It's not just isolated to COVID-19. The best advice I think that we can give is to talk about it, to find a source of support and to seek help. Remember that mental health services are ongoing. As I said, there is the Richmond Helpline 1770, who one can call at any time and seek, seek help and support for that. And we are doing our utmost to continue with, with, with mental health services to, to help and support people mm -hmm. in need. So if you're unsure, um, definitely a helpline, speak to your family doctor, to a trusted, a trusted uh, healthcare professional. And that's important because the Richmond, um, the Richmond survey on, on the mental health uh, issues associated with COVID-19 has shown that a lot of people for medical advice and healthcare advice go mostly through social media, online, and they are least likely to ask for medical advice, both physical and mental, to healthcare professionals. But this is our job, um, this is what we are specialized on, mm -hmm. and we're here to help, so please seek help. It's, it's understandable for people to feel this way at times, mm -hmm. but there's always help available. Um, so you mentioned resilience during your presentation. So what if someone who prior to this pandemic itself was already super sensitive to many, to their surroundings and uh, they suffered already from anxiety and mm -hmm. these feelings are obviously heightened during this time. What would you advise definitely, someone? Definitely. So yes, um, people who have already, in fact I included, I included them in the people who are more likely to suffer from the stress of COVID. So people who already have had mental health problems in the past mm -hmm. with anxiety, with obsessive compulsive disorder, especially related to germs, for example, those who are fixated with germs and wash their hands frequently. As I said, we have to limit, as Dr. Greg said before me, the exposure to media and to news and bombardment with, with these things, as well as making sure that we have a support network and look for help when we need to. Mm -hmm. So it's the same advice, look for support, we're available. Um, it might seem hard, but there is, there is treatment, there is help, and not just treatment with medication, there's psychotherapy. There's a lot of things we can do for people who undergo the, the, these issues. Um, but yes, limit the, the information given, try to keep a normal routine, basically the, the things that I mentioned during my presentation with regards to coping with the stress. Mm -hmm. And it's the same for everyone, whether or not you have a mental health problem. Specifically, if you are already being followed up by a psychiatrist or a mental health team, make sure that you have access to that team or to your family doctor um, if anything urgent crops up. Mm -hmm. um, so another question a, a viewer sent in was um, about mental health well well-being in postpartum, especially during um, oh. these times, yes. So yes. Um, here I run the perinatal mental health clinic in Gozo. Mm -hmm. So I've ha I've ha I'm having experiences of um, our clients having heightened anxiety 
due to the COVID-19, especially since they were clustered under the vulnerable um, group. Mm -hmm. At the moment, it doesn't seem that COVID-19 is causing increased harm in newborns or, but you know, as, as I said, it's a new virus. So we have to be careful and make sure we take all the measures. But it has been very difficult, especially for those who have, for example, to give birth on their own or the partner only coming um, at the last, at the end, or being having be, been separated from their partner or from their child because they're positive or vice versa. Also, there has been an effect on, it's already difficult for new mothers, especially if you don't have any other parents in your group, in your social group, to confine in someone or to, or to find friends. So social distancing has resulted in, for example, um, mother-baby groups to stop meeting, and this, this has been a, a huge, has made a huge impact on uh, new mothers and fathers as well. Um, and it's a special period because we know that even for the newborn, the first three years of a child are one of the most important time for, for the child to develop. And if, if there's problems during this period, then there, there might be long-term problems. But there is also a way to tackle this. Um, I, I urge mothers, for example, to still keep in contact with each other through social media. And, and with uh, with other groups, and as well, if there are new mothers, uh, mothers are out there who are feeling overwhelmed, increasingly depressed, and anxious about this, then seek help. The midwives are very helpful many times, and they're the the first person a mother, a new mother goes to. And there is both in Malta and in Gozo now. There are the perinatal mental health services available through the National Health Service. So you can access that service as well, usually through your family doctor, through your midwife, or your obstetrician. Mm -hmm. So again, if, if you feel overwhelmed, you can seek help. And again, it's not just about medication. It's about support, it's about counseling, it's about, about psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So there exist these groups of new mothers on Facebook yes. as well? So many times people are, are being inventive and creating um, online platforms on which to on which to speak to each other and share their experiences. It's a new community, so exactly. to say. Okay. What, I, what I would like to say, though, is that, again, this is something in the short term. There, there will always be the rainbow afterwards. But yes, COVID-19 is a stress. It's an additional stress on the usual stresses. But we can, we can work, to, work through it. Thank you very okay. much. Um, now I would like to introduce um, Dr. Joseph Kassar, who is a consultant psychiatrist and senior lecturer at the University of Malta. Um, what is interesting about this speaker is that he himself contracted the virus. Um, he is a frontliner in this pandemic, um, so it is very interesting to hear his experience. Hi. Hello. Hi, good morning. Hi, Dr. Kassar. Everything okay? Okay, okay. Basically, I stopped um, during my, one of my clinics. Um, today, I do the university students' wellness, mental wellness clinic. So, I stopped a bit to, to be with you all. Good morning to all. I'm not sure how much time I have. Um, I think you have about 20 minutes. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess my experience uh, starts off very interestingly because today, after, you know, after the whole process passed, I can say I was one of those asymptomatic carriers, positive carriers. And I was, and one may ask, why, why, you have known that you're positive if you are totally asymptomatic. Well, the only way I knew, I came to know, is because um, when I was working in, uh, I work in Mater Day and I do consult liaison psychiatry, which is basically, you know, seeing patients in Mater Day hospital, um, in the emergency room and in the hospital, um, all those patients who are there for other problems and who develop or have psychiatric issues. 
And of course, we are in frontliners. And you may imagine by now that the virus has been with us for some time that um, a number of people who come to the hospital are asymptomatic. Today, um, we, we check a lot of the patients. Most all patients who go for surgery are swabbed. All patients who go for a lot of the interventions are swabbed. But um, when I contracted the virus um, back in, uh, in April, um, it, obviously these things were not used. Masks were still not, um, not something that, was, that we, we were using. In fact, unfortunately, some of us who were using masks um, were frowned upon. Um, and the reality is, uh, probably I did get it from, uh, from the hospital. And what happened is that um, one of my doctors, who happened to be working with me, was actually my daughter, um, who had seen a patient with me in the emergency room. And they called her, um, I remember, on a Saturday. And uh, they told her, you need, to, you need to go into quarantine and swab because the patient you saw um, turned out to be COVID positive on admission. And my daughter was actually wearing a mask, um, but I, I had gone for, for only a few minutes without the mask in a closed room to see the patient. And since my daughter, since they called my daughter, um, I said, you know, I'll take you to swab. And once you swab, since we live in the same household, I'll swab with you. And little did I know that my daughter um, came, came out to be negative. And uh, I remember it was 10.30 at night um, when one of the public health doctors uh, called me to, tell, to let me know that I was positive. And I was like taken aback. It was a big, big shock. Um, that in reality was very hard for me to, to, to handle because the reality in the very beginning, now we know a lot more about the virus. Not that we know too much, but we know a lot more. But in those times, we knew very little about the virus. And albeit I was without symptoms, I did know that people do develop symptoms um, and that at times symptoms come on acutely. So, <clears throat> The first experience was living for 14 days, because in those times it was 14 days symptom free, and then you swapped again, and then you have to do another uh, week after you swap negative in isolation. So I did the first 14 days uh, in isolation. So there were two experiences. One, uh, living for 14 days expecting every day to develop symptoms. I tell you that is not a nice experience. And probably that is the most difficult of the whole experience. Waking up every day. Um, I remember those day, those in those times in the very beginning, there was I, I, I don't know if you remember, but there was like a a scale, like a, a Likert scale. And you know, there was day one, day three, day, you know, every day what symptoms people feel. And uh, so, you know, you, you count the days and you wake up and you say, whatever, what, 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 if, what will I develop, you know, diarrhea, will I develop a cough, will I develop? And, you know, and you spend a day alone uh, waiting for the symptoms. So that is a, a very difficult experience. And then the second difficult experience is that you spend a whole, you know, I spent a whole three weeks in full isolation. And basically, I was in uh, in our bedroom. Um, unfortunately, my wife had to, you know, stay in a, in one of my daughter's room rooms. And my daughter was actually in quarantine in a different house, so it was a bit of a of an interesting situation. Um, and uh, isolation is also a very interesting experience because, you know. Uh, spending a day in isolation is tough, but spending three weeks is really something that, you know, in the beginning um, is quite a scary experience. But we, interestingly, and I must say, um, this is probably what I would 
tell everyone. All the fear and all the negativity that comes into your head seriously goes away if you live, I would say, the trick of the day, which is living day by day and living moment by moment. So the moment you do that and you say, you know, you wake up, the first thing I, I did was do a routine. So you do you set up a routine. I remember I, I used to make sure that I don't stay in bed, that I, you know, I do as much exercise as I could, which is basically walk around the room. I used to count the steps of how much I used to walk, but that's all I could do. Um, and uh, after setting up a routine, you stick to the routine. And I remember I had this routine where, you know, I wake up, I wash, I used to obviously have to wash my clothes because um, I didn't want anything to go out of the room for, because of contamination purposes. So I used to wash the clothes and then hang the clothes. Um, um, and then, you know, have, my wife used to get me breakfast behind the door. I used to put on the mask and uh, open the door whilst my wife goes downstairs so that, you know, again, there will be no contact whatsoever. Put, pull the tray inside. And we, I used to have everything in plastic so that we made sure that then nothing goes out of the room. And I used to keep everything in a, you know, in a big black bag. And I remember, uh, thanks to my wife's um, foresightedness, because, you know, I must say she was really a very, very important figure in those three, three weeks. Thanks, thanks to God, she was there all the time. Um, psychologically present, and if it were not for her, I don't think I would have done it as well as I did. But I, you know, she used to tell me now wash all the plastic containers because otherwise, you know, if, they, if they're going to stay there um, in for three weeks, they're going to, you know, they're going to stink. So I used to actually wash all the plastic containers I used to eat from, so that when I throw them away, you know, they wouldn't stink. So everything was organized, and then I used. To so here mass at 9.30 and then I used to start, you know, either reading or following, at, at, you know, immediately I started following patients. So I started seeing patients online and I, I used to have a, lot, a number of meetings online. I, I even gave uh, lectures online. So, you know, I had a very busy day and believe it or not, you know, time literally flew. I remember the first thing some people told me, you know, you'll see a lot of, you know, TV programs and you read a lot. But believe it or not, I only managed to read one book and I saw very, very little um, TV. I used to see, you know, some TV in the evening. In, uh, in fact, we used to do, you know, I used to watch TV with my wife. My wife used to stay in her room and I used to stay obviously in my, my room. And we used to decide together what movie we would see together. So that at least we'll be doing something together as well. And, um, I also say, you know, I, I heard Dr. Anton Greg's um, uh, lecture, and interestingly, I, I say, thank God for social media, because even social media helped a lot. For example, I never ate on my own. I used to have lunch and dinner uh, with my family, with, with my wife in the morning, and then with the whole family in the evening. Um, they used to be downstairs, I used to be upstairs, and we used to use um, a social platform um, like we're using now. So, you know, you're in Gozo, I'm in Malta, and we are basically seeing each other and talking as if we're in the same room. So we used to, you know, have dinner and lunch like this. Again, um, it was very interesting. And I must say, even as a psychiatrist, um, I never imagined how powerful online telepsychiatry is. In fact, to date, people still want to do it and still opt to do it, and it's very efficient. I always say, thank God we're psychiatrists, and my wife is a psychologist, so she also does everything online, and because we don't need you know, stethoscopes, you know, we don't need to do abdominal examinations, we don't need to do examinations, and our tool is our mouth. And with Zoom and with Skype, you know, and with a number of other media, we can basically um, make believe that we are in the same in the same room. The other experience I, I must I, I must say is that you know I lived a very um, 
a very interesting spiritual experience. Um, I am a spiritual person, but I'm not um, very, I mean, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not like, you know, obsessed spiritually. And But yet this experience actually got me very close, um, very close to God, very close to um to the moments, you know, where I could, uh, I used to follow, for example, um, the Pope's Mass every day, which was very interesting. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, that that got me very close to, to God. And I do believe people who are spiritual and use uh, spirituality during this experience, it, it also helps. I mean, there are there is research which says and it's very clear that, you know, spirituality in itself is healing. So, you know, we know that psychologically, spirituality is used um, as a healing process as well. And I must say that for me, um, re-experiencing my, spiritual, um, my spirituality was also a very important experience that I, I went through. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what really got me through um, was my my wife and my two daughters and their support, their constant support and um, their constant reassurance. And I can only imagine that even those people who live alone, the best thing we can do for these people is to actually touch base with them. It is interesting how much um, through telepsychiatry I've come to understand that even the elderly know how to use um, social media and social platforms a lot. So we can't use the, you know we can't use the ex, ex, you know excuse that because they are elderly they don't know how to use it. I mean it's very easy to use, and uh, it's something that helps a lot. And it's something that really touches the person's heart to be able to see someone you love, um, even through the social medium. But I still believe that it doesn't make a major, major difference um, when you see someone through the social medium, because as long as you, as you can actually see the non-verbals and the verbals, but especially the non-verbals, you can really attest to the feelings of the other person. In fact, um, as a joke, we, we used to say, but a serious, it's not really a joke, because when we see patients face to face, we have to wear a mask and a visor. And it's very weird, because with a mask and a visor, especially in psychiatry, you can't really read a lot of the non-verbals. Whilst I always tell them, you know, with Zoom and with Skype and with Teams, you don't need to wear a, vi a mask and a visor, short of you not being in, with someone else in the room. But you know, when you're in isolation, you definitely don't need a mask and a visor. And so you can actually see, as you're seeing now, um, my non-verbals, my facial expressions, which you, could, you can see much better than with the people you've just had lectures with, because you, can, you had to see the person with a mask. So you couldn't see anywhere around the mouth, which for psychology and psychiatry is an extremely important anatomical area that people need to look at. So, you know, there is always a, sil um, there's always a silver lining to every cloud that we have. I think that's, that's all I, I have to say. <laughs> um, thank you very much. So um, what I found interesting about your whole experience is Obviously, given your job, um, you get to meet people who most probably suffer from mental health problems. And what I would like to know is, we heard how it affected you then, but now, how, how are there any repercussions in order um, to recover from such a thing? Was it difficult or maybe are you still in the process? Well, I must say it was an it was a in itself it's an experience which you will I will never forget and as I said we still don't know too much about the virus so as you realized already when someone used to tell me but you know I already got it you won't get it again well you know lo and behold we know that you can get it again so um, the fear that I can you know get reinfected is there as much as for anyone else and we don't know if you get reinfected how it will affect you. I've had friends who are also doctors who have been affected badly. 
And uh, so I live like every other human being in fear that it can happen. And as being a frontliner and seeing patients all the time, um, you know, does put us at risk and it's not easy. Going back home every day from hospital, um, albeit, you know, I take all the measures, you know, I wash the clothes on their own, 60 degree temperature, and I, you know, have a shower every time I go into home from outside. But, you know, you're still, you know, you're still in a way exposing your family. But then, you know, one of the decisions that, again, thank God that my wife is very supportive, you know, when I, in the very beginning, I said, you know, should I, you know, should I leave the home until the virus, you know, um, the scare goes away? And, um, you know, thank God my wife said no, because at the end of the day, who knows when the virus will go away. And, you know, had I done that, probably it will be very difficult today to go back home. Because, I mean, today we're in a much worse uh, place than we were in April and in May. So, you know, um, but again, we have to thank our families, you know, who, who bear with us, who actually take their own risks. Because every day I go home, every day I go home and my daughter comes home from hospitals, you know, we are putting at risk both my wife and my other daughter who don't go out of the home. Um, but, you know, the, you know, family love ultimately um, supersedes everything. Because as I said, you know, I know a number of people who left home in the very beginning, but now they're going back home. Because, you know, how long are you going to stay away from your loved ones? I mean, there is a limit. And we don't know when there is an end, a real end to this problem. So I think, you know, we really have to think not just about the frontliners, but about their families. Because I seriously believe that without the families and without their support, the frontliners will really crumble. I can only imagine what people who, in fact, have no, who don't have a support system, what they can what they can be feeling at the moment. Do you have maybe any advice for those people? Well, my advice is that, you know, rather than, well, for those people is that, you know, they try to, to use the social media as much as possible. But for all the other people who are out there who want to help these people, I would say, especially, you know, in Malta, we have a number of parishes which have volunteers who do a lot of voluntary work. I think one of the things we can start doing is to, you know, literally help these people um, by helping them through social media to stay in contact with them. And if they don't know, we teach them. Because, you know, being in, in, in contact with someone, seeing someone, talking to someone will make all the difference. And I think this is what, um, what comes out positively from this experience of this virus everywhere in the world because you know everywhere in the world believe it or not even a number of conferences you know one starts wondering you know why did people spend so much money to go for conferences when you know conferences can be done online um well you know you might say you know the, the tourist industry will be helped yes it's true but at the end of the day you know conferences cost a lot of money and, you know, social media have really given a solution for a number of things. So I do, I do encourage parishes, parish priests, you know, volunteers in parishes, because I know they're very strong, both in Malta and in Gozo, to use, to help, you know, people who are living alone, to help them with social media, to be able to touch base with them, to be close to them, um, and to be able to, you know, make sure that they can talk to someone because, you know, loneliness is seriously a very big problem that can cause mental health problems. Um, thank you very much uh, for sharing your experience with us and also giving us advice on how to cope with the situation and if we do become contractors of the virus, how to cope with it. Thank you very much and I hope you have a nice day. Thank you. Have a good conference. Um, so the next person I would like to introduce is Renata Spinelli-Martins, who is going to give us a few tips um, on mindfulness, a few exercises. Um, this will take 15 minutes. Um, I hope you can enjoy this presentation.
So I would like to just share a few tips with you about um, mental health and COVID during these difficult and challenging times. A lot of people are suffering with anxiety and you don't always know or people don't always know what to do. Uh, and there are some small and quick techniques that I can show you to perhaps help you um, ground and get rid of the overthinking or the fear. Um, so the first thing I want to, to show you is basically just how to shake your body, to bring you back into your body. Because when you're in your body, you're in the present. And when you're in the present, you're not thinking about the future. And this is what anxiety is. It's fear and overthinking about the future. So if I could just invite you to stand up just for a few seconds. So literally something just like this. You know, you're just bringing your senses back into your body. And you can feel, feel into it. Feel if there's any tension, go one way, go the other way. It can also be like a nice little gentle massage for certain parts, okay? Or something really simple, just like stretching, you know? You wake up in the morning and you yawn, yeah? Just being in your body. So that's one very simple thing that will take a few seconds or a few minutes for you to do. Brings you back into the body. Another thing you could do is a body scan. So this is a short meditation. So I'm just going to invite you to sit back into your chair. And if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. If not, I'm just going to invite you to lower your gaze and follow my, my guidance. So we're just gonna run, run, few, run through a few little uh, tips and ways of bringing you back into your body through a guided body scan, which is a short meditation. So I invite you to connect with your breath. So breathing in and inflating your abdomen and your ribs and your chest. And when you breathe out, just deflating your abdomen, your ribs and your chest. So being aware of the breath, moving into your body and out of your body. I invite you to bring your attention to your feet, to your toes, the soles of your feet, your heels, and notice any sensations in your feet. Are they aching? Are they tired? Are they well? How are your feet? Just notice. I invite you to now move your attention to your legs, to your shins, your calf muscles, to your knees, to the lower part of the legs. Is there any tension? What sensations can you feel? What sensations are you aware of when you focus on the lower parts of your legs.
and taking a deep breath and just releasing the attention from your legs, the lower part of your legs and your feet and now moving your focus to the upper part of your legs, your thighs. How do they feel? What sensations are you noticing? And inviting you to take another deep breath and send that oxygen, that life force energy all the way through your body. And releasing the focus now on your thighs and moving your attention to your torso. So bringing your attention to your abdomen. How does it feel to be breathing in to your abdomen? Are you breathing in to your abdomen? So just noticing without judgment, there's no result you need to achieve. No right way or wrong way to do it. Just being aware. And now bringing your t attention to your back. What sensations do you notice, are you aware of when you focus on this part of your body? Are you able to relax a bit more as you bring attention to this part of your body? Are there any niggly bits? What sensations do you experience? And now bringing your focus and awareness to your chest. Can you notice the air coming in and out of your body through your ribs, through your chest? What happens when you focus on this part of your body? Reminding you that there is no right way, nothing to be achieved. Just notice and become aware of how your body feels right now in this moment. What's alive for you right now. And letting go of the torso and moving your awareness and your attention now to your neck. and your shoulders. How do they feel? I invite you to take a deep breath and send it to this part of your body. Often we do hold a lot of tension in our shoulders. A lot of tightness in our neck. Especially if we're stressed or worried. So just breathing in and oxygenating your body 
And now moving your attention to your face. Feeling your cheeks, your nose, your eyes, your chin. What sensations are you aware of when you focus on your face? Is there softness? Is there tightness? What are you aware of? Often as we bring attention to different parts of our body, we're able to relax and release some tension. Just by noticing what it is that we're experiencing and noticing without judgment. So letting go of your face, letting go of this part of your body and moving your attention to your head, the top of your head, the back of your head. What sensations do you pick up on when you focus on this part of the body? Your forehead as well. So now letting go of the focus on your head, I invite you to take a deep breath in and send it all the way through your body. Imagine it running all the way through the parts we've just traveled up through. And I invite you to slowly start to become aware of your surroundings. Bringing you back into the room, noticing any noises. And inviting you to wiggle your fingers and your toes. and take a few more deep breaths. And when you're ready, you can gently flutter your eyes open. So that was an example of a body scan. It can be as short or as long as you would like it to be. You can just do it, you know, um, very quickly. You could do a quick 10 second check, see how you're doing, see what's going on inside of you. And this can bring you back into the present, back into your body, back into the here and now. Or you can do a slightly longer version, like what we just did now. So I hope you find that helpful. Welcome back to our studio where we are broadcasting live from Queen Mary University of London, Malta campus here in Victoria Gozo. 
I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I do encourage you to take on board the tips um, that were mentioned. I know I will. Um, may I remind you to send in your questions via our Facebook page. Um, so the next presentation is by Dr. Polen Grek, who is an author and senior mental health lecturer. And her presentation will be about the perspectives on mental health during this pandemic. Hi. So during this session, I am going to be sharing with you some perspectives on the local nation's mental health as it evolved during the first stage of the pandemic in Malta. So during the first stage of the pandemic, like many others, I was stuck at home trying to maintain with, with some kind of routine and trying to adapt to the changes that were going on. Something that intrigued me was how the nation was coping the psychological attitudes and the mental health issues that were being faced by the general population. And I really wished to explore this. And so I engaged in a document analysis process about local mental health issues and psychological attitudes during the first stage of this pandemic. What is document analysis, first of all? Document analysis is a process whereby you access documents. Now, these could be online documents, printed ones, newspaper articles, leaflets, anything as long as it's a document. And then you analyze these documents in order to extract information about that particular theme that you have in mind. In my case, obviously, it was related to mental health and psychological attitudes. I had two actually very simple research questions leading this process. The first one was, which were the main local psychological attitudes visible during the first stage of the pandemic locally? This was followed by the second research question, which was, which were the main mental health concerns during the first stage of the pandemic in Malta? Now, what I did was I accessed documents, um, documents that could be found that were published on online news portals between the period of March to June 2020. Now, I did this on a daily basis. So every evening, uh, every evening I accessed the online news portals. I searched for, 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 for articles that were related to the COVID situation in Malta. And then I started to go through them. First of all, I scrutinized the title and the content in order to remove the non-relevant ones. Obviously, as we all as we all, as we all know well, at the time the, the, the news was uh, was completely taken up by the COVID situation. However, not all the articles were related to mental health, and so I could um, I could just remove those. Eventually, when I ended up with my lovely bunch of articles for the day, I analyzed them. I used that, which is called the thematic analysis process, whereby I looked for and extracted those themes, those codes and eventually themes which were related to mental health and psychological attitudes. Then I analyzed these themes, these attitudes and these emotions, I explored them and tried to give some meaning to them. Then every day I wrote an article on a blog in order to present each of these emotions and give an understanding as to what was bringing about these kind of emotions and, that in and attitudes within the local population. I ended up during this period with a total of 45 emotions and attitudes. During this session, I am going to present the major ones underneath five teams in order to showcase the most important, the, the, the most relevant um, emotions and attitudes that emerged within the national, uh, the national um, place. So the first team is that which I called the toilet paper frenzy. I think we remember at that time, at the first stage of the pandemic, the rush towards the shops and everyone was, not everyone, but many of us were stocking up on food items and toilet paper. Um, this was despite the fact that the authorities were, were sort of telling us that we do not need to panic. We just needed to maintain our, our normal routine, but just be a bit more vigilant about hand washing, respectful sneezing and coughing and so on and so forth. However, some of us, 
sort of um, uh, followed this advice and tried to, to continue living as normal as they could. Others, however, rushed to the shops um, and indulged in several coping mechanisms. And what brought about these changes? One way of explaining it is called the locus of control. Basically, this refers to the degree of control that a person feels that they have over the outcomes, over their future, over their life. Um, uh, if we refer to a person having an internal locus of control, usually it refers to the fact that a person feels, feels quite confident that he or she can, can sort of control their destiny, that they can deal with any approaching threats, and that they can cope with any situation. That's the internal locus of control. However, then there are people who have the external locus, who have an external locus on, of control, and this may lead to that fear that they are not able to control their destiny, the outcome, and their future. They feel as if it's not in their hands. Basically, kesara sera, they tend to feel helpless and that they cannot do anything to cope. And this usually leads to feelings of anxiety. Um, uh, moving on, then, apart from this, uh, from this possible explanation, we find those who indulged in a holier than thou attitude, meaning that these were the people who snubbed those which rushed to the supermarket and labeled them as being panicky and childish. Um, um, actually, they may have been secretly questioning whether they themselves should be rushing to the supermarket or, or at least taking some kind of, of precautions. Yet some of them really um, believed that it was all panicky and it was all beyond them um, and preferred instead to do nothing about it and just, rest, uh, just be happy that at least their dignity would remain intact even if they would eventually not be able to cope with the virus. They were the ones who did not end up with shelves full to the brim with, with toilet paper and canned foods as some of us did. And finally, there were those during the very beginning who were really, really laid back, the relaxed ones, the ones who did not bet an eyelid in the face of an approaching threat and who simply just continued with their normal routine following the advice of the, of the authorities but doing nothing apart, apart from that. Um, uh, these attitudes, these, these, these psychological attitudes boil down to one's personality. So it's not kind of an, an automatic, it, it's an automatic reaction actually to an approaching threat. And it's one that is ingrained within the person's personality, a kind of attitude that the person would have engaged in all throughout their life in the face of other challenges. Only it would probably es have escalated um, or it, it, it is amplified during a greater threat, which is that of an approaching pandemic. But something that is definitely brought forward um, in the face of these different attitudes is the fact that we need to be tolerant. These are the different personalities in play, different characters, all in a way amplified due to this threat that we had never experienced before. The second theme is the first cases. On 7th March, we had the first case of COVID in Malta. Obviously, this led to an escalation of national anxiety. The anxiety was really tangible in the air. It could literally be felt. As the number of cases rose, rose to nine, schools closed, leading to a higher level of panic, anxiety, and fear. And this was mostly due to the change in routine, especially in the case of young children, it meant that they had to be kept at home, um, away from school, 24-7. Now, in the cases, even in the cases where parents did not work, this proved to be challenging, but especially in the cases where both of the parents had to work, I mean, something had to be done, a lot of changes had to be done. To be done. Keeping in mind that, that the kids could not be sent to the grandparents because authorities were advising otherwise, obviously due to the possible risk of transmitting the, the, the virus to the, parent, to, to the grandparents. The next considerable impact was the termination of religious services in Malta especially the Sunday Mass. Now, it has to be kept in mind that 
Sunday, for most of us, for many of us, Sunday is synonymous with mass. This not, does not mean that we are a religious bunch, because it is also a part of tradition. It is also a way of socializing. So suddenly, all of this tradition, socializing and religious aspects came to a stop. They were stopped. You could not do that anymore. And I think this really um, brought, brought, it really made visible the fact that life is not as we know it anymore. This is not a temporary, thi a temporary thing. We are in this for the long haul. This led this and the other changes definitely led to a dip in the nation's morale. And it was at that time that the burden on mental health really started to be felt. Two mental Help, uh, two mental health helplines were launched, a state one and a non-governmental one by Richmond Foundation. Um, additionally, telesupport was also offered, um, uh, but still the mental well-being of the population faced great challenges, even greater than the physical threat itself, may I add, at that point. And then we were all logged in. Really and truly, a full lockdown was never imposed on the island, but most of us voluntarily decided to lock themselves in their home, shifting to teleworking, or if they had to go to work, they just went to work and back home, and that was it. This led to boredom and dysthymia, sadness, joining the pre-existing emotions of anxiety and fear. Um, uh, additionally, there was also the fact that you could not engage in social activities anymore and in face-to-face -face conversation anymore. Now, we have to keep in mind that we, as, as, as a nation, we tend to be quite tactile in our communication. We, we are the ones who touch each other's shoulders, who touch each other's hands whilst we are having a conversation. Now, we could not do this anymore due to obvious reasons. Thankfully, there was social media and the online world, and many of us resorted to that, and it was a good coping mechanism. However, there was heavy use of social media, and this led to, to some unhealthy consequences. There was over-involvement in the online world, and there was information overload, a term which we heard a lot at that time, in fact, March, April, um, and ultimately this resulted in some people in mental exhaustion. Another challenging behaviour was overeating. People were spending more time at home, they were anxious, they were fearful and they were bored. Three ingredients for an overeating cocktail, if I may call it that. This is alarming, obviously, because our, 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 in our country, the obesity rate is already one of the highest in, in Europe. And probably the consequence of that will be as, as great as the consequences of coronavirus itself. There was also the financial losses and the closure of businesses, which further added um, to dipping the morale of, of the nation. Something that did not really help was the phenomenon of social contagion. What is so social contagion? In simple terms, it refers to gossiping, which is something, an activity that, again, the Maltese people do and love doing. Usually, it is quite harmless. Um, it is just a habit, if I may say so. However, when in situations such as this crisis, it can have quite harmful consequences, especially because of the generation of, the generation, um, of inaccurate information, usually negative inaccurate information about the number, the daily numbers of COVID cases in Malta, deaths, and so on and so forth. And this really exacerbated the fear and the anxiety um, in, the nature, in, in, in the nation, and it is still doing it, unfortunately. The third theme is defiant attitudes. It could be noted at this time that there were some people who did not abide and still do not abide to these protective measures. Is this due to arrogance or ignorance? It could be, most probably it is in some cases, but not necessarily. Some, some theories that could, be, that could help to explore these defiant attitudes are called health behavior models or health behavior theories, which explain why people think and behave the way they do in relation to their health. One of them, for instance, is the popular health belief model. And let me read an example for you. Take Jack, who is a fit 18-year-old cool guy in the corona era. 
Jack has captured, captured the message that it is the elderly and vulnerable who are mostly at risk, and even if he gets it, the symptoms will probably be mild. And so, in his thoughts, giving up his nights out is a change that he can definitely do without, simply because the risks do not really outweigh the benefits. And this is the main, um, the, 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 the main uh, philosophy behind the health belief model, that if the risks do not outweigh the benefits in terms of a health behavior, then probably the person would not be willing to change anything in his or her lifestyle. Then there is Jill, who is an elderly lady with mobility challenges and who lives alone. For her daily life is already a struggle, a painful struggle, and any change to her routine is a mammoth task. She does not believe that she can outdo coronavirus because it is too much hassle for her to try to do so. Her daily visits to the grocer to buy staple needs and chat with the other customers is her only joy and she does not believe that she can change her lifestyle. This is in fact called self-efficacy self or in other terms, a person's confidence in their ability to take action and to persist in that action despite obstacles or challenges. It is in fact an element of the social cognitive theory, which could be another possible explanation for such health behaviors. Then there are other things. For instance, the virus is not a sumo wrestler, right? It is an invisible bug. And usually that which you cannot see poses a milder, a milder threat than a large threat, which is in your face. Then there is also that urge that we have that inner urge to protect our freedom at all costs. Now, when the authorities imposed the restrictive measures, obviously that was a threat to our freedom. Some of us accepted it in view of the benefits outweighing the risks, but some of us engaged in that called reactance. Reac reactance is that feeling that you have to react that you have to fight for your freedom and you have to disobey all the guidance out there. Um, obviously, it is, it, is, it is not healthy. This reactance thing is not healthy, but it is also hard to resist. And so these possible explanations are other than arrogance and ignorance, and they are explanations which possibly give more meaning to why some of us were engaging in defiant attitudes. And finally, there was the stage of moving on at the end of June, the numbers subsided. And that was when uh, the buzz term adapting to a new reality was developed. And yes, there was the process of adaptation. Simply adaptation is when you take bits of your old pleasures or habits and throw them in the food blender with the new stuff. And according to mental health guidance, this is what one needs to do to survive and recover during this, different, this difficult period. Looking for similarities though, rather than differences, similarities to your old lifestyle, to those things that you used to do, and trying to maintain some kind of normality. Obviously, we had to get used to the masks. We are still getting used to them, even during this local stage two of the pandemic. There is the difficulty in not being able to smile at people because they would not be able to, to, to see your smile. There is the difficulty with communicating with people. We've heard of people saying that they cannot even, even because of the fact that the, that the voice is muffled when one wears a mask, so it's still taking some getting used to. Then there is also the social distances imposed in all places where you have to keep your distance and still not touch anyone physically. So these are things that ended the stage one of the pandemic. But thankfully, most of us could enjoy some good moments during summer. Until then, unfortunately, stage two of the pandemic kicked in. This pandemic brought with it several negative issues. It had several negative consequences. However, one thing, one positive thing that it br did bring about was the focus on mental health. Suddenly, mental health is on the agenda. Suddenly, it is not only those individuals who have a mental illness, um, uh, who have had a mental illness for a long time, who sort of need to get help, suddenly it's 
a lot of us who suddenly need support because of the challenges that they are facing during the pandemic. It would be interesting to, cope, to compare the psychological attitudes and mental health issues that we are engaging in as a nation during this second stage of the pandemic, because they are totally different from what we were seeing during the first stage of the pandemic. During the first stage, it was all kind of a novelty. We were cooking, we were baking bread at home. We were all unearthing those hobbies which we never really had time to do. Those who never used social media suddenly, suddenly were at it all day long, if not all night long, because it was all something new. During the stage two of the pandemic, it is not a novelty anymore. And I would say that the, although the anxiety is still there, um, perhaps the fear is not so great as it had been during the stage one of the pandemic. Still, listlessness, for example, is very dominant during the second stage of the pandemic, as well as also um, sort of boredom because this seems to be never ending. We seem to be going to be living in this state for a long time, which can even lead to feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, which are not at all good, um, good features for, for mental health. Still, we'll see, we will continue providing mental health support. Our nation is, is providing a lot of support and it's important, obviously, that people speak out um, in order to receive the support that they need to take care of their mental health during these challenging times. Thanks. Um, thank you, Dr. Polen, for that presentation. Uh, here with me now is Dr. Michael Galia. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Galia is a clinical psychologist and family therapist, author, and also a senior lecturer at University of Malta. He will be speaking about how this pandemic affected the elderly, and you can take and us away. And still affects. And still affects. And still affects. Exactly. Okay. So, in this presentation, we are going to talk about how the elderly uh, are affected and what measures they can take to cope against this uh, situation, which very often is uh, quite challenging, not just for them, but also for uh, those who take uh, care of them. The starting point that I believe we should all uh, begin with is uh, the voices, very often the unheard voices of our elderly. My life has changed. Exploring a new me is unsettling. The world around us can change in a second. Nothing can be taken for granted anymore. Letting go is painful. Although danger seems to lurk beyond my front door, my home does feel like a sanctuary, to a certain extent, of course. When isolating isn't by choice, and is to avoid a deadly disease, panic-inducing thoughts are hard to escape from. Old mechanisms, old coping mechanisms, like, for example, when you say to yourself, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. At times, it looks like it's stopping working. Mornings are particularly hard, challenging for many. So what are we talking about? We are talking, one, about our elderly and their mental health status, and two, about our reality, COVID. We have heard so much, and believe me, God knows what, how much more we have to listen about it. Elders are part of this vulnerable group, susceptible to higher stress. Having lived through this pandemic for months now, and having more questions than answers about what is in sight, is another reality that needs to be noted. According to the World Health Organization, Elderly mental health very often suffers from a number of mental health disorders. 
let's forget a little bit about COVID. Who is this population we are talking about? 15% of people 60 years plus normally have some kind, suffer from some kind of mental health disorders. Out of which 4% of older population suffer from anxiety, depression, etc. As to regards gender, males 75 plus have a higher suicide rate risk than any other age group. Related issues include isolation, unpredictable present and future, dramatic challenges of moving from being independent to become dependent, waiting to be helped, to be assisted for everything. Now, Possible triggers for mental health problems in the elderly normally are chronic pain, chronic disease, physical impairments, disabilities, loneliness, major life changes, grief, an area that I wish we can spend a whole conference on, grief, widowhood, certain medications, substance misuse, etc. Now, COVID has dramatically increased and heightened this reality. Statistics in Malta, there are still in their infancy, but we already have, we can already peep through the window and see what's going on. My colleagues before me already mentioned some of them. I'm going to refer to Richmond Foundation. This is data that is publicly available. In April, July and August this year, they did this survey among a number, thousands of people. And from this continuum of four months, just four months, respondents' perceptions are already clear. Number one, COVID is increasingly seen as a bigger threat and therefore the concern is heightened. Number two, the management of the health situation is perceived as getting more lax over time. There is an increase. Increase in what? Increase in meditations, increase in video calls and social links to one's family and friends. This is the horizontal perspective, I call it, the me and the other. But then, more worrying, there is a decrease. A decrease in what? Decrease in healthy eating. Decrease in physical exercise. In routine. Making own bed. This is the element that looks within me. Of course, everything is increasingly heightening the challenge on healthcare workers. For example, we need, it's very hard to have a realistic evaluation of our elderly. Reasons would be external. Number one, we are talking about subtle symptoms, questions whether these are life changes, health issues or otherwise. But then, of course, one has to note the internal. For example, the high possibility of underreporting. Reasons may be stigma, as people before me already mentioned. Ignorance in terms of, do my symptoms look more physical or psychological? And of course, with the elderly, as sometimes happens with other groups, the difficulty explaining what one is going through. So this puts more pressure on the caregivers. Caregivers need to understand symptoms and risks, limited, linked to common mental health problems. Also, to be diligent in observing and communicating those changes or symptoms to healthcare professionals. Step one, where do we start? First things first, do our elderly understand what their mental health disorders look like? What those symptoms refer to? 
For example, one common effect of everything going on around us is anxiety. Now, anxiety can include shortness of breath, chest pains, fear of heart failure, racing thoughts, uncontrollable thoughts of disaster, doom, gloom, bladder problems, sleeplessness, rapid mood shifts, sweating, muscle pains, fatigue, etc. Let's not forget, information is power. It is important that these things are broken down, are explained more clearly to our population in focus, to our elderly. Now, going through this list, what do you notice at first glance? This list is very similar to the symptoms of COVID. What happens with this? It can lead to a vicious cycle. I may already be somehow, somewhat anxious, but now knowing about the symptoms of COVID, it becomes a vicious cycle. Let's not forget that this anxiety easily becomes contagious. We pick it up from those around us, which reinforces what we already have. So what's the real danger here? COVID remains what it has always been, if not more, a real danger. Anxiety is closely linked to an unpredictable present and future when a person perceives that he or she is losing control. So what's next? Incorporating new healthy habits does indeed help. And that's where we are going to look at now. So how to manage mental health impact of COVID-19? Two key components, in my opinion, help our elderly to empower themselves and to be also better assisted. Number one, intrapersonal attention. Things that the elderly need to be aware of. Number two, it's the me and thou, me and the other, me and my friends or families, the interpersonal domain. So let's look at this, the intrapersonal domain. I wish to share with you three step model. The structure and routine, being cognitively active, and also being physically active. Let's start with the first one. Loss of structure and routine is already identified as a major mental health issue for our elderly. During this pandemic, this issue is bound to worsen. For example, if you are moving to being self-isolated to protect yourself from infection, then it's crucial to establish a routine ASAP. Where to start? Start with a week planner. For example, ensure a routine about bedtime, waking times, meal times, work activity, online times, getting outside to exercise. This is a simple uh, template for the week of what you can do from Monday to Sunday, morning, afternoon, evening. That one can do. Of course, by time, you will get used to it because we are creatures of habit and you won't need any papers uh, and templates to guide you in. Here, I wish to present some cautions. Number one, security. For example, the World Health Organization in its situation report on COVID preaches about ensuring the adequate three-pronged precautionary measures, uh, meaning social distance, hand and respiratory hygiene. So our elderly need to be explained what these are in simple and relevant terms. Number two, another caution, alcohol. It's a significant problem among elderly. Abuse of alcohol significantly contributes to mental health problems. Another thing that was already mentioned by uh, my colleagues before me, social media. Be care, beware of information overload. Digital screen time is better reduced to prevent misinformation and also to prevent panic. 
Let's look at number two, how the elderly can help themselves. Being cognitively active. For people with dementia, but also other elderly, not just people with dementia only, cognitive exercises are very beneficial. Research continues to attest to this. What does it mean? Being involved in board games, word games, get engaged in cooking, do something. Gardening, housework, playing music. Perhaps you find, you search for a support group online for dementia sufferers. Practice medication, meditation. Of course, it's never late to learn something new. Lastly, being physically active. Social distancing measures still allow us to go outside. Be careful about contact with others, but go out for regular walks. Right now, we are living in the fall, in, in, uh, in, in a season where it's excellent to go outside. Who is there to stop you? Also, why not learn, practice yoga? If you don't know how, always good to learn it. And then the second part that I wish to share with you is the interpersonal. So first we saw three points on the intrapersonal. Now let's look at the interpersonal. Social isolation is another public health concern, more relevant now due to the physical distancing measures. Two points are so relevant here. Social connectedness with our loved ones, with our uh, close friends, but also social integration, both of which are... Uh, first of all, our elderly need to be involved in decision-making at family levels during times of such crisis. When we ignore them, of course, that's going to have a ripple effect and a lot of damage, mentally and emotionally. In our times when we are seeing an increase of the phenomena known as aging in place, this pandemic makes it more of a must to get our aging friends online. For example, in the United States, over 70% of older adults are already internet friendly. Help them pick and choose the news they consume. Of course, news can be overwhelming. Cutting down on news updates gives our mind a break and avoids unnecessary anxiety. Find activities to help our elderly to socialize. You can socialize online, of course, social media platform. But of course, there is the phone. Don't forget, our phone works both ways. And if uh, your elderly may be a bit stubborn in not calling their friends because their friends are not returning their calls, but keep inviting them to initiate themselves, to make a call rather than to sit down and uh, wait, play the victim, sort of. Check in daily on the aging adults in your life. This way they feel connected. Give them an extra call. Ask them if they need anything. Please never assume. As we say in class, you know how assume is spelled, making an ass out of you and me. Never assume, particularly with this kind, with this group of population. It may be that when you ask them, how are you? They will tell you, okay. But behind that okay, please unwrap it. Please break it down. Perhaps, they don't feel comfortable to tell you that they are in pain. They don't know how to explain themselves that they are depressed, perhaps worse still. They are shy of telling you that they are having suicidal thoughts. Last word on spirituality. Results show that as a cohort, spirituality is still very relevant amongst our elderly here in Malta and Gozo. Having to stay at home or cutting down from most religious services is another setback for them. Keep up to date with their own parish or religious program. A number of local parishes streamline their services. It's only for you, being their caregiver or a family member, to remind them of these things. Staying socially connected, even remotely, is crucial. 
This is my take-home message to you. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Galia, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we have a few questions coming in. Of course. But because of the element of time, um, I can only ask you one question. That's okay. So, what interests me the most is this phenomenon of ageism, this kind of social per perception that, you know, elderly people are sort of less or inferior than others and they're being discharged earlier out of hospitals. Can you elaborate further on this? Yes, and it continues with also the uh, element of intolerance and uh, at times if not stigma and prejudice as well uh, towards certain uh, element group of people uh, who are v very often seen that they are taking most of the uh, health in general services. But yes, uh, as we saw uh, in this presentation, uh, as we hear, and we all have our elderly in our lives, okay, with our parents, grandparents, etc. Uh, these are ex exceptionally vulnerable population, and uh, very often the problem is that communication-wise, uh, we don't hear enough of their voice. We don't understand enough of their problems, but the problems are there. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not hearing, because I'm not, uh, because you are not telling me that you have issues, it doesn't mean that you don't, right? And uh, more so with the elderly. So I need to uh, use the empathic shoes uh, model or metaphor, uh, going into their shoes and trying to understand what is this, okay? Uh, one, one way how to fight against ageism, against, a, uh, against any kind of uh, prejudice mm -hmm. is by getting close to that person and thereby I am realizing that there is nothing to fear about there is nothing uh, uh, okay uh, w w these are human beings they have blood running in their veins uh, th they are individuals with their needs like I have my needs so this is the way how we uh, should approach the situation rather than uh, putting it under the carpet or, mm -hmm. or, or preventing it because that will definitely be a disservice to our society and especially to those people who have been responsible to some extent directly or indirectly to who we are today mm -hmm. because we know it to them and uh, a day will come when we will be in their shoes exactly. let's not forget that <laughs> exactly um, so I'm afraid that's all for today. We had more questions, Thank but you. time is running out. Time is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So up next is Carl Wright, who is a journalist and a family therapist. And he also contracted the coronavirus. So he will be giving us a first-hand experience of what he went through and how he coped with it. Um, he can take it away. Hi, dear all, good morning. Thank you very much um, for this invitation. Um, I was asked to come over here to share with all of you my experience of being. It's Carl Wright, uh, family therapist. Um, I was asked to join you this morning um, to share my experience with being COVID positive. I'll do this not just by telling you the story, but also by reflecting. Choosing my words, aiming at being therapeutic to self and to others, including you, of course. The first thing I would like to share is my state of being and feeling right now. I feel good that I can continue to talk about it to share my reflections and support whoever might be touched with even one simple aspect I am going to share. 
I also feel very grateful to those who believed that my input this morning has the potential to make a difference in your thinking processes and into life in general. I also feel, honestly, a bit on edge as I make myself aware that I'll have to go through reliving that particular experience, which although it wasn't physically painful, as I was asymptomatic, it was disturbing, it was hard, it shook my whole family system. It presented a challenge, and believe me, at times, it was like living a nightmare. Mindful of the whole experience, the way it unfolded in that particular time and context, I listen to myself right now and I realize my words expressing my thoughts embody a sense of relief and calm. I remind myself I'm healthy. I remind myself I managed to go over it as I've done with other challenges I faced throughout my life so far. I highlight my own resilience and I prompt myself to think of how beautiful life is and how I can allow myself to get excited on my future, which is right ahead of me. Honestly speaking, I feel very hopeful. Preparing this speech, I went through my own Facebook page where deliberately I chose to only share reflective experiences and quotes on a daily basis, aiming at steering reflection among followers. I also revisited news articles and interviews I gave after deciding to go public on this matter. It was exactly the last day of April, a routine swap test mandated by my employer on that very same day resulted in a cold shower with a telephone call I had received late in the day. I believe it was like 11.30 in the evening to reveal that I was COVID positive. It was like, what the heck? <laughs> and now what else? Uh, what's next? It was evidently that I was taking it lightly while watching TV, you know, dozing off. Um, it was the least one would expect. So it was like a mix of surprise, shock, disbelief. Listening to the voice on the other side of the line, reading my personal details, it was like, hey, car, wake up. You've hit the jackpot. <laughs> it's, you have to, to believe because that is the way it goes. After that call, immediately sharing my news uh, with my partner who was right next to me, I realized I was worried. I was really concerned about the vulnerable family members at home with us back then, most especially my partner's father, whom I was very close to. I clearly remember, for example, the day before I was giving him a clean shave. I had no choice at that very moment other than waiting for the whole family to swap and to wait for the results. And I was instructed to stay in the same household for the next 24 hours. Thank God the results for all the other family members, including the vulnerable ones, came out negative, which was a relief. It was the beginning of the next phase of this journey. I had decided to move out of the house and accept my employer's offer to stay in a flat which had been prepared 
for such cases. I must say, um, the employer, um, the foundation for the social welfare services, I work for the foundation in its Gozo branch, was very, very sensitive. I remember myself following a protocol, packing up and leaving the house. The last words I've exchanged with my partner were, let's do this, will be in constant contact with each other and will support, through, will support each other throughout. It felt so fast. I found myself in a flat belonging to a porch. Ironically, it was the same place I had visited a couple of times in a, sp a span of two years to provide therapy to clients. This time round, I had to persuade myself that that was the place I had to live in for around two, three weeks, or a month, if need be. Settling in, as I had no symptoms at all, I had decided to do two things. Firstly, I wanted to email my workplace colleagues to inform them myself about the situation. And that was specifically intended for my own acceptance process as well, to accept the reality. Secondly, I wanted to go public about it. To my knowledge at that time, there were two persons who had gone public on the matter after their mandatory quarantine. One of them we've met and heard this morning, my friend and colleague, psychiatrist, Dr. Joe Kassar. As a, as a psychotherapist in the care profession, I wanted to go public as early as I was starting my mandatory quarantine to ensure the best use of time in support to self and to others. While I had asked my superiors to allow me to continue working remotely, as I wanted to keep myself busy in the usual routine as much as possible, I wanted to speak out boldly and loud enough to be heard against the stigma, which I strongly believe is fought with openness and honesty, with telling the whole truth and with education. At the same time, I promised myself to go out there and reinforce courage rather than reinforcing fear. Allow me to remind every one of you that this was May, when we as a population were still too afraid of this new and modern plague called COVID-19. It was still very unknown to everyone. My plan hit the ground running on the very same day I wrote a lengthy Facebook status as I had spent close to 20 years in journalism before changing my career to an individual couple and family therapist, I believed my message would spread faster as I was already known to many. Mine was a public face and a public voice. In fact, a lot of colleagues in the media sector chased me for the interview and like the COVID is now, I was really everywhere. More than for any personal gain, I wanted people to relate, to feel it was fine to talk about it, to understand that staying at home was the safest thing to do back in time. I had emphasized the importance of structure, the making of quality time together, and the need to support each other by making that short phone call, by listening to each other more, by not judging others. In a particular interview I had given, I remember myself saying that I had to be grateful to COVID-19 as it was a challenge I looked at from different perspective, making out of it an opportunity. It got me closer to the sick, including COVID-19 patients with symptoms, but also those suffering from cancer and with different illnesses. 
It got me closer to those who live by themselves. Sad, lonely, depressed, and abundant. It got me closer to those who suffer in silence, missing loved ones. It got me closer to single parents denied access to their children, perhaps alienated as well. It got me closer to those in fear of contracting the virus, in fear of meeting others, in fear of people's judgments. I remember myself saying that fear could be overcome with courage and hope. And that was exactly what the massive exchange of emails, calls, SMSs, and social media messages was about. Coming from friends, colleagues, ex-colleagues, students I lecture, and ex-students, past and present clients, and people I have never met, but who plugged the courage to connect, relate, and support themselves, seek support in the process. That was my effective medication. In back-to-back -back conversations, in documenting my own reflections in a personal blog I had created back then during that time, in sessions I continued to hold with clients, I realized that time was really passing fast. Not to mention that I had to make sure every single day to include a time structure. Waking up time, having breakfast, washing and handing, hanging of clothes, and keeping the place tidy. Not allowed to go out, I used to exercise by walking back and forth from one side of the apartment to the other while holding phone calls. In the background, there was the situation at home where my partner was the sole carer of our vulnerable family members. To be honest, it was very hectic. It was not easy to convince old-aged persons that they couldn't be out on the street. I felt very frustrated that I couldn't be physically there, present, to support, especially when my partner's father had to be hospitalized. I have to admit, though, that this frustration and other mixed feelings amidst all that was going on at home was balanced with much love and care coming from plenty of close friends who were fully supportive at all times. Returning home after the mandatory quarantine was really not the end, as my partner's dad held it till that very day of my return to confide with me that he was not feeling well and that he felt he was dying soon. He did, in fact, pass away in less than 24 hours. Even though he didn't pass away suffering from COVID-19, it was hard to accept that it wasn't permissible to accompany him to hospital, to be next to him in his remaining hours of life, and to give him a proper salute after he rested in peace. This is all change that people had to digest in such a very short time. Was anyone prepared to this? Dear all, we are all survivors. Contracting COVID-19 or not, we are still alive. We still manage to cope. We still find our way through. While this gives us the sense of life, it reminds us of the huge responsibility we have to our own life and over the life of others. By way of conclusion, I wanted to share the reflection which you may have observed or came across, observed through the social media lately. It is a snapshot of the here and now, making us reflect on our positioning as humans in this world. And it goes something like this. We fell asleep in one world and woke up in another. Suddenly, Disney is out of magic. Paris is no longer romantic. 
New York doesn't stand up anymore. The Chinese wall is no longer a fortress, and Mecca is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly became weapons, and not visiting parents and friends becomes an act of love. Suddenly, you realize that power, beauty, and money are worthless and can get you the oxygen you're fighting for. The world continues its life and it is beautiful. It only puts humans in cages. I think it's sending us a message telling us you are not necessary. The air, earth, water and sky without you are fine. When you come back, remember that you are my guests, not my masters. I had said it on record, as we journalists say, and I reiterate, that I strongly believe that the COVID pandemic too will pass. It is not life imprisonment, but a suspended sentence. Let us live day by day, show respect to self and to others. Be responsible, be healthy, be kind and be patient. Carl, thank you very much for sharing your experience, for being raw, vulnerable and honest and possibly being a silent, a part of the silent movement aiming to break the stigma surrounding COVID. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so very much. Up next, we have Dr. Dr. Daniel Vella Fondacaro, who is a specialist trainee in psychiatry and a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Um, he will be giving us a feature on the correlation between anxiety and physical, physical activity. And it will be related to minors, teens, and youths. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Vela von Dakaro. I'm a psychiatric trainee. And uh, today I'll be talking about the impact of COVID 19 on anxiety levels and uh, levels of physical activity. And I'll be presenting some preliminary findings of the first phase of a, of a research project we're doing at the moment. Um, and uh, I'll start by just giving some information about, in general, about COVID, and then um, I'll skip on to the, to the, to the research project. Uh, basically, um, uh, as you all know, COVID-19 was I basically declared a pandemic on the 11th March 2020. By who? Um, this after it was um, identified as a viral pneumonia in Wuhan on New Year's Eve of last year, and eventually it was declared as a public health emergency of international concern by WHO as well, and then it became a pandemic. Now, the, the big thing about the pandemic is, um, it's not just a buzzword, but it creates a whole new set of mental health symptoms, because first of all, even the word itself strikes fear into a lot of people. And uh, apart from that, um, uh, it, the fact that it creates a lot of isolation, a lot of uh, lockdowns and uh, loss of jobs and uh, loss of financial control in families, um, we started seeing a lot of uh, clients and young people and parents uh, presenting with a lot of anxiety and, uh, and concerns during the COVID-19 period, especially in, in the beginning and the beginning of the, of the second wave in Malta. And so we decided to go ahead with, with, this, with this research project. Um, um, there were a lot of, re of, of research studies carried out, especially in China at first, um, and uh, um, one particular um, uh, research project done by um, uh, Zhu et al. Um, in, in 2020, this year, earlier this year, um, uh, basically found out that there were very high rates of anxiety, um, basically 34.7% um, uh, of anxiety and 43.7% prevalence of depression in a Chinese cohort of more than 8,000 people. 
Um, eventually, a lot of uh, researchers started coming out as well with their own anxiety scales. Um, um, some examples over here, there's, there's the COVID-19 anxiety syndrome scale, for example. Um, and eventually, this started impacting also on, on sports and physical activity. And we started seeing main sporting leagues, such as in Italy or in England or in Spain, um, being postponed. Um, and when we talk about sports, I think it's important to know what, what who um, recommends as being the, the, the optimal um, amount of sports that a young person should do um, daily. And who, in fact, um, uh, recommends that um, uh, a youth, a, a child or a young person between, the five, between 5 and 17 years of age should do at least 60 minutes of uh, a moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, especially aerobic um, sp sports, aerobic physical activity. So using constant oxygen, such as swimming, running, um, uh, and cycling. Um, there were a lot of studies as well regarding COVID-19 and physical activity, perhaps not as much as COVID-19 and anxiety. However, um, uh, a particular study in China as well found out that um, basically COVID-19 and during the pandemic, we observed a, a reduction in the median time spent in physical activity, an increase, an increase in sedentary lifestyle, and an increase in screen time, so video games, computers, etc. And so went ahead with this cohort study titled A National Prospective Cohort Study on Anxiety and Physical Activity Levels in Young People Attending Community Mental Health Services and Their Parents During and Following Global Pandemic. And these, the aims of the study were to compare physical activity and anxiety levels in young people attending SIPS. So SIPS is the Child and Young People Services Department in Malta, as the National Community Young People Mental Health Clinic. Um, so young people attending SIPS and their parents during and following the COVID-19 pandemic period. We also wanted to determine whether there is an association between physical activity and anxiety levels and to qualitatively analyze potential triggers for changes in physical activity anxiety levels during and following the COVID-19 pandemic period. Now, when it comes to the method, um, first of all, we started by developing a questionnaire. Um, and this questionnaire had to be as concise as possible because the least thing that um, uh, people wanted, young people and their parents wanted during the pandemic is to stay filling in questionnaires. Um, and uh, uh, basically, this, this questionnaire included a consent form for the, for the, for the parents and, the, and an assent form for the, for the young people, um, demographics, one, the first qualitative question, which was, do you feel that COVID-19 situation has made uh, you more anxious and how? And uh, there was a second qualitative question, which was, do you feel that COVID-19 situation has affected your physical activity levels and how? And there were two scales. So basically there was the GA7 scale, which is a validated scale in adolescents um, to, uh, to screen for generalized anxiety disorder. And it's basically made up of seven items um, uh, and each and every item is basically a symptom or a group of symptoms and the person has to rate um, uh, whether in the past two weeks he experienced or he or she experienced those symptoms um, either um, several days a week, um, more than half of the days or nearly every day. And that corresponds to a, one, a score of one, two or three respectively. And then there was the second um, uh, screening tool that we use, which is the GLTQ score, the Golden Leisure Exercise Time Questionnaire. And basically, the Golden Leisure um, uh, Time Exercise Questionnaire. Yes. And uh, basically, what I like the score, I like the screening tool because it's very concise, it's very short. It basically asks the person, the young person and, and, and the caregiver, um, uh, how many times a week he or she did um, strenuous exercise, moderate exercise, and light exercise. And then you multiply the strenuous exercise by nine, the moderate exercise by five, and the light exercise by three. And uh, um, basically, the, the, the study is divided into two phases, um, it being a cohort study, a comparative analysis. So we want to do a cross-sectional exercise at the moment, okay, during the COVID-19 period. That's phase one. And then phase two will come after the, the COVID-19 pandemic period when, when obviously everything's over, when who declares that the COVID-19 pandemic period is over. Um, and then we'll do a comparative analysis. 
And so till now, I can only present preliminary findings from phase one, because obviously phase two is not with us yet, because um, uh, the pandemic is still ongoing. Um, and uh, what we did is we ac accessed um, uh, data from, from SIPS, from the SIPS department, from, from the Young People's Community Mental Health Clinic, um, and we needed active cases at SIPS, okay, so um, not discharge cases because this is a prospective study, okay, and uh, the ages um, were 12 to 17 years of age, so adolescents, um, and so the date of birth had to be between 19th May 2002 and 19th May 2008. And all active cases at SIPS amounted to 2,187. Um, uh, there were 875 young people between the age of 12 and 17 years of age. And what we did is we manually went through all the case notes of these 875 young people to get the correct contact details. And then what we did, we had 19 research assistants who um, phoned um, the caregivers of these, of these young people um, to, for three main reasons. One, to uh, get an email address, address so that we can send the questionnaire. Two, to um, give informed um, information about the, the, the study itself, okay? And three, to obtain verbal consent. And the people who um, gave those three pieces of information um, were included in the phone calls um, uh, later on, um, a few weeks later. Some people opted for an email, for a, for a postal address instead of an email address, that was fine. We still sent, um, uh, we still sent some results by post, some of which we're still, we're still waiting for. Um, um, these 19 research assistants had uh, meetings, information meetings before and during the phone calls. That was very important to keep the exercise as standardized as possible. And, uh, um, um, it would have been good to meet face to face, however, um, respecting social distancing rules, we had to meet by uh, remotely, basically, online. And uh, there were 607 caregivers who verbally consented to be, to be part of this research project. Um, so basically we um, sent out um, uh, 1,214 questionnaires. And the reason for that is that um, every envelope that we sent, every email address that we sent had two questionnaires, one for the young person and one for the parent. So we had 607 questionnaires for young people and 607 questionnaires for the caregivers. Um, uh, eventually, um, so as I said, phase two will be coming soon um, when who um, declares the, the end of the pandemic, then six months later, we'll do the same cross-sectional exercise with the same questionnaire, we'll send the same questionnaire and then we'll do a comparative analysis. And these are just some results from uh, nearly a completed phase one. So till now we had 323 completed questionnaires, 139 young people and 184 caregivers filled in the questionnaire. So we had a 26.6% response rate. Uh, hopefully um, in a couple of weeks that will push that up to 30%. 43% um, of young people um, uh, replied the questionnaire and 57% of caregivers. Um, uh, sent in the questionnaire. Some people did not fill in the, the questionnaire appropriately, the GLTQ and the GA7 appropriately, and therefore those were excluded from, from the analysis. So we only took, um, uh, took up for results those completed questionnaires, not the incomplete, the partial ones. Um, on, in table one, you can see that um, we have a, a mean GA7 score both for the young people and the caregivers. So the, main, the mean anxiety score, the mean GA87 score for young people was 8.18 and for, for caregivers was 9.22. So I have a very similar mean there. Um, and then we had 71.9% of young people who said that the pandemic had an impact on their anxiety levels. On the other hand, we had 82.6% of caregivers who said that uh, the, pan the pandemic had an impact on their anxiety levels. So there was a slightly more um, percentage, just a, a bit more, a, a few num um, there was more caregivers of the caregiver group who said that the pandemic had an impact on their anxiety levels. Um, when it comes to physical activity, so the mean GLTQ score of young people was 26.6, which was more than the caregiver group, which was 20.93. Um, and there were 64.7% of young people who said that the pandemic impacted on their physical activity levels, and there were less, slightly less, 58.7% of caregivers who said that 
the pandemic had an impact on their physical activity levels. If you go on table two, if you see table two, we can see that we, uh, we checked basically how many young people and caregivers scored more than 10 on the G87 score, and we used that, we used the, the cutoff of 10 based on previous literature, such as Spitzer et al. And we found out that there were more caregivers, 42.9%, than young people, 36.7%, who scored more than 10 on the G87 score. So again, we can see a slightly more um, uh, sort of anxiety um, uh, level in the caregiver group than the young people's group. Um, here, there are some qualitative reasons as to why um, young people and caregivers felt that um, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted on their, on their anxiety uh, levels. And the main reasons were basically not leaving the house, so isolation, um, scared of getting infected, change in general routine, not going to school, etc. That's in young people. When it comes to caregivers, then again, we had very similar um, results as scared of getting infected, not leaving the house, and having children at home for long hours. When it comes to reasons for a, dec for a decrease in physical activity levels, okay, so how the COVID-19 pandemic and why COVID-19 pandemic impacted on phys physical activity levels, we found out that the, the main qualitative reasons were um, training establishments closing, okay, for young people, and uh, young people were so scared or unable to leave the house, and stop PE at school, at schools. Um, uh, for, for caregivers, then we had uh, similar reasons as well, so scared of or unable to leave the house, but then we had dif different reasons as well, such as uh, no free time due to the children's online education. Um, if we see the next slide, basically, we can, uh, this is divided into two, so there's the blue part on the left corresponding to young people's results, and the orange part on the right corresponding to caregiver results. And if we start from the blue part, from the, from the, the blue half on the, on the left, we can see that we divided the young people into two, the less anxious group and the more anxious group in table three, um, according to the median, which was seven, the median of the G87, the G87 scores. And from what we found out, the, the results were pretty similar. So we had a, a, a score of 24.39 GLTEQ, physical activity score, in the less anxious group, um, when compared with a 21.17 score of GLTEQ on the, on the more anxious group. And the fact if we see the scatter plot on, uh, on, on the, at the bottom, underneath that, that table, we can see that the line of best fit is pretty, pretty horizontal. So that starts giving you a, an idea about the correlation um, uh, between those two uh, variables. And uh, we can see that we, ha we had an R value, a Pearson correlation coefficient value of minus 0.09, which is a very weak um, negative correlation. And that was statistically, not statistically significant. So we had a P value of 0.35. If we go to the right side of the, of the slide, we can see that, so the caregiver, the orange part, we did the same exercise, so we divided the, the caregivers into um, the, the less anxious group and the more anxious group based on a median of 8.5, and you can see that the median there, just like the mean, is, is more than the, the median in, in the young people, okay? So it's 8.5 in caregivers and seven young people, but there we can see in the caregiver part, we can see a difference. We can see 11 points of a difference in the GLTEQ score. The less anxious group had a 26.41 score of physical activity, GLTEQ, and the more anxious group had a 15.67. And in fact, if you see the scatter plot underneath the table, we can see that, that the line of best fit is slightly more slanting than, than the left, the, 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 the young people's um, uh, scatter plot. And in fact, the, the R value is, uh, was minus 0.31, which is still a weakish um, negative correlation. However, it was statistically significant with a P value of less than 0 0.001. So just to summarize from these findings of phase one, um, so the mean G87 score of caregivers was slightly higher than the mean G87 score of young people. We can see that it was just slightly higher, 9.22, um, when compared to 8.18, but we'll see whether that's statistically significant when then we'll do the phase two and we'll do the comparative analysis. We also found that there were more caregivers, 42.9%, who 
scored a G87 score of more than 10 when compared with a 36.7% fraction of young people. Um, uh, we also observed that in both young people and caregivers groups, the mean GLTUQ scores were higher in the less anxious group. Um, uh, basically, when obtained in the, in the caregiver group, so we were saying it was correlated significantly in the, in the caregiver group. Um, uh, perhaps a limitation of, of the study was that there were a lot of, um, sort of fluctuations when it comes to restrictions in, in our country. So, um, uh, but then again, this study um, observed mostly the, the pandemic in general rather than taking, taking uh, into account the, the changes in restrictions and, and the changes in, in, in lockdown periods. Um, the way forward, I, I believe, it's to complete phase one and prepare for phase two so that then we can do a, a comparative analysis. And eventually after this um, uh, cohort study, this prospective cohort study, then we can do a, a feasibility study for the launch and service evaluation of a COVID-19 young people's mental health clinic. Um, uh, obviously following the results of this um, uh, national prospective cohort study. Um, eventually it would be good as well to do a qualitative analysis to explore protective factors such as sport during the pandemic period. Um, and that's it from my end, so um, thank you for following and uh, um, have a great conference. Dr. Vella Fondacara, thank you for that presentation and thank you to all those who are still with us in this live session. Um, however, the conference is not over just yet. We still have uh, Professor Anthony Warren, who is the Dean for Education, Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry, Queen Mary University of London, who will be joining us via Zoom. And uh, right now he is in the UK. And I guess that's the beauty of technology. Not only can we deliver this conference, but he will be joining us from the UK. Hi, hello, Professor. Hello, Carla. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and thank you very much for, for giving me the, the opportunity to make a few closing remarks. Um, uh, you say the conference is not over. I can promise you it's very nearly over because I won't speak for, for terribly long. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody who's made this happen. In particular, I'd like to thank the, the Mental Health Association of Gozo for organising it, um, focusing particularly on the work of Colleen and, and Jeanette. And thank you for, for uh, supporting us today and stepping in as, as the moderator. Uh, I, I'm great, very grateful for the, the speakers, particularly Her Excellency, the former uh, president, whom I've had the pleasure of meeting on several occasions and has always been tremendously supportive of the work that we've been doing, Gozo. Um, Anton Grech, whom I, I know well from many meetings in, in uh, my time in Malta. Um, Chantal Atsopardi, Joseph Kassar, Paul Anne Grech, Michael Gallia, Carl Wright, um, Daniel Avella von der Caro that we've just, just heard from. Um, this is such an important subject and it's so uh, uh, important that we spend time talking about it and thinking about how we're going to uh, help people in this totally unprecedented time. Um, people have complained that we're using the word unprecedented too often. Well, there's a reason for that because it is quite a remarkable uh, uh, experience that none of us have, have had before. And so that's why it's sort of thrown up so many challenges. Um, the, the, the work continues. Um, there are work workshops next week um, on uh, uh, um, many uh, issues that, that I think will be relevant, but unfortunately they're fully booked. And I, I only mention it not to tantalize people, um, but to say that uh, we plan to do this again. And uh, in future, you need to get off, off the mark quite quickly because it clears up a lot of interest in this. We're really interested in working through social media channels. Um, and our plan is to have monthly events sponsored by Queen Mary University of London, Malta, uh, Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry, frankly, around issues that matter. One of the things that's tremendously important to us uh, at the university is for us to be relevant and embedded in the community that we serve. We're not an ivory tower. We want to be part of the community and we want to make a contribution to debate and health education 
and health generally in the countries that, that, that we're operating in, operating in. And so with that, I'll close. Thank also um, my, my colleague, uh, Michelle Lockwood, who of course has made this happen, along with our external consultants, uh, Melanie and, and Naomi. Um, and thank everyone else for participating in this. It's important. I believe this has been valuable. And as a university, we're delighted to be part of it in Gozo. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Warren. Um, now I will be joined by Pauline Camilleri, who is the president of the Gozo Mental Health Association. Hi, Pauline. Hi. Um, would you like to give a concluding statement? Yes. Um, I sincerely thank Queen Mary Multa Campus, because without their constant collaboration and support, this virtual conference would not have been possible. I want to thank, most of all, Mel, Naomi, and, uh, and I don't remember the other names, but those two kept, us, kept with us throughout, throughout the, the preparation of this conference. They kept really abreast with our demands and with our needs. Your response has been extremely encouraging, and we promise to continue supporting you all in your mental well-being. Our next conference is to be held on the 22nd of 2021. This is an appointment with you all, hopefully in a different environment. Hopefully that will meet physically with you all, not in this kind of circumstance. Um, I thank you all for joining us. Stay safe and let's keep connected. Goodbye. Thank you, Pauline, for that um, conclusion. Um, I guess this brings us to the end of the conference. Um, it has been an honor for me to host and moderate this event. Um, even though it was quite short notice, it has been a very great experience for me. Um, may I remind you that you can watch this conference um, again since it is on Facebook and you can invite other people to watch this conference. It has been a very enlightening and educational experience. I hope that you not only took um, from an educational point of view, took away from this, this, um, this event. I also hope that it has helped you a bit with your mental well-being and that you can take on board a few tips and tricks to maybe cope with this whole pandemic. Thank you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.